De La Salle Model United Nations Community presents Hosi, ASEAN Youth Career Summit 2021 organized by De La Salle University's first international central committee in partnership with Southeast Asia Global Affairs Network co-hosted by ASEAN Youth Advocates Network.
De La Salle University through the De La Salle Model United Nations Community presents For C, a CN Youth Care De La Salle University through the De La Salle Model United Nations Community presents For C, a CN Youth Care Summit 2021 organized by De La Salle University's first international central committee in partnership with Southeast Asia Global Affairs Network co-hosted by the CN Youth Advocates Network De La Salle University through the De La Salle Model United Nations Community presents For C, a CN Youth Care Summit 2021 organized by De La Salle University's first international central committee in partnership with Southeast Asia Global Affairs Network, co-hosted by ASEAN Youth Advocates Network. For C, ASEAN Youth Care Summit 2021 features Workforce Singapore, for CSCN Youth Care Summit 2021, we'd like to thank the following sponsors. Our co-presenter, Deloitte. Make an impact that matters. Super Cheeto. And Deb Curate. Our major sponsors. Launch Garage Innovation Hub. Startup Acceleration by Founders for Founders. Philippine Digital Asset Exchange Incorporated. Garma Farm Incorporated, keeping it natural. CodeGo. Ahead Learning Systems Incorporated. Thrive Project, measuring what matters most. Global Minelia Group, be borderless. And Dream Action, integrated AI powered human capital solutions for predictive self assessments and recruitment solutions. Our diamond sponsor, WorkBank. Let's invest in you. Our platinum sponsors, Coronia. And Morning Clothing. Our emerald sponsor, Gardenia. Zalora Philippines. And Saltees, your printing partner since 2011. This event is also powered by Keen Studios and brought to you by Wicked Candles. We would also like to thank our media sponsors, Business World's Spark, U.ph, TechKuya, and Astique.ph. 
for CSCN Youth Career Summit 2021 would also not be possible with our partners. Our Ruby Partner, European Studies Association. Our Gold Partners, CPU College of Arts and Science Provincial Council. Qualified IPH, Filipinos Career Accelerator, San Beda Junior Marketing Association. Be the Juan PH, UNSW ASEAN Society, Transcend, Inglicom, La Salian Youth Orchestra, Management of Financial Institutions Association, Student Catholic Action, DLSU, Online SDG Youth Action Forum, DLSU Chorale, Humanitarian Legal Assistance Foundation, and DLSU Office of Career and Counseling Services. Our Silver Partners, Biko University Order of the Blue Feather Society, Model United Nations UPD Laman, Biko University United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization Club, Kilos Co Youth, Adenea Project for Asian and International Relations, and Philippine Institute of Civil Engineers de La Salle University, Desmarina Student Chapter. Our Bronze Partners DLSU IS History Club, UST Industrial Engineering Circle, Animo Model United Nation, De La Salle University, Desmarina's College of Engineering, Architecture, and Technology Student Government, and FAST 2020. UPLB College of Arts and Science Student Council, UP Business Management Society, De La Salle University Das Marinas College of Liberal Arts and Communication Student Government, University of Asia and Pacific Loco, UPLB College of Arts and Science Freshman Council, Pagikab Project, the Ateneo Assembly, Charisma Movement. Polytechnic University of the Philippines, International Studies Executive Consortium, Kabataang Voluntario, and Physics Society Adamson University. Global Millennial Group hadir untuk membantu kalian. Membantu kalian yang merasa bahwa sekolah, kuliah, pendidikan formal nggak pernah cukup bagi kalian. Kami menyediakan platform-platform di mana kalian bisa bertemu dengan orang-orang yang sama, konferensi, submit, competition, kelas-kelas soft skill, dan lain sebagainya. We are a one-stop soft development solution. Contohnya Global Millennial MUN. Di sana kalian bisa belajar negosiasi, diplomasi, bertemu dari orang dari seluruh penjuru dunia. Wonder Voices, kalau kalian ingin fokus untuk memperkuat public speaking kalian. Indonesian SDG Submit, ketika kalian diminta untuk melihat dunia lebih dalam, bahwa kita sedang tidak baik-baik saja, dan memberikan solusi kalian. Atau... Di global Indonesia, ketika kalian ingin menggebrak batas diri kalian dan menjadi pemuda yang go internasional. I'm Arshia Kalitra and I have been a student of Wonder Boys Speech School. Hi, this is my Arora. Hello everyone, my name is Jocelyn and I participated in the GMMUN. I'm Nika Villanueva, a country ambassador of Global Millennial League for the Philippines. Hi everyone, my name is Nidifar, I'm 19 years old and I'm from Tajikistan. I'm not gonna lie to you, my experience at Wonder Voice has been one of the best experiences of my life. 
I found some really great connections here. I got the chance to lead a global team and conduct events internationally. And from that previous conference I joined, I gained so many friends. They were all funny and nice and it also helps my public speaking skills. It is a journey combined of challenges and experiences that will make you put a check off your bucket list. During my internship, I gained a lot of valuable skills and experience. It was my greatest pleasure to work with high motivated Indonesian youth with diverse background and mindset. Masih banyak lagi yang bisa kalian ikuti. Solusinya sudah ada. Sekarang pertanyaannya adalah diri kalian. Kalian tidak perlu untuk menunggu menjadi orang paling pintar, paling cerdas, paling hebat. Tidak. Zig Ziglar, seorang penulis Amerika pernah berkata, You don't have to be great to start, but you have to start to be great. Kalianlah yang harus mulai, and make yourself work the best. This is the story of Dea. In a few months, she'll graduate and make a big decision, choosing a major. But which one? Should she be a graphic designer? An accountant? You know what? She decides to find out for sure what she really loves doing. Right, here we go. So, from her personality and interests, her dream job is to be a developer. Ah, that's right. That's where her passion really is. Now it's clear what she should study computer science. So, she sends her uni application, confident in her choice. This is Dea. In a few months, she'll graduate and make another big decision. Her first job ever. But where? All right, let's find out which company is right for her. Hmm, okay, let's see. So, from her personality and working style, hmm, it's a match. This company is a perfect fit for her adventurous personality. Her psych profile is also fit for a developer, so she knows it's the right one for her. This is the story of Dea and her dream job, doing what she loves. Discover the right career for you with Dream Talent. Go to dreamtalent.id and discover your dream career. Whether you're off to work, 
on the road or out under the sun. Always have the confidence to be what you want. Play. Work out. Have fun. Because there's always a Coronia color to match every Filipino woman. So keep it fresh. Keep it vibrant. Keep it colorful. Celebrating 50 colorful years with Coronia. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us in our Global Affairs panel for the ASEAN Youth Career Summit. We will be formally beginning in a few minutes. For those who have just arrived, kindly fill out the general attendance log sheet through the link or QR code, which you may see on the screen and in the chat box. Thank you.
every corner. De La Salle University, through the De La Salle Model United Nations Community, presents For C, a CN Youth Career Summit 2021 organized by De La Salle University's first International Central Committee in partnership with Southeast Asia Global Affairs Network, co-hosted by the CN Youth Advocates Network. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Maybe even good night. Wherever you may be, we gladly welcome you to the ASEAN Youth Career Summit's next event for today, which is which will focus on the Global Affairs Panel. I am Andy, one of your hosts of this panel. I am Simon, also your host. Fostering diplomacy and social awareness is indeed important amidst this difficult time. And in just a moment, we'll delve deep into what our esteemed speakers have to say on these issues. As a disclaimer, we would like to let you know that all views, teachings, and perspectives coming from this event are solely of the AYCS 2021. The invited speakers, panelists, and the participants are not of the ASEAN and the organizers, affiliates, sponsors, and partners. But before anything else, here are our netiquette reminders once again. Kindly make sure to turn your microphones off to avoid any form of interruptions. Kindly fill out the general attendance log sheet through the link provided in the Zoom chat box or the QR code flashed on the screen. Please observe proper online decorum at all times. The event will be recorded for documentation purposes and live streamed via Facebook Live on our official page and that of the co-hosts and co-partners. And finally, all relevant questions directed to the speakers will be specifically accommodated during open forums. Hence, please avoid sending them through the Zoom chat box at an unreasonable time. Right. So now, may we call on our project directors, Lan Sua and Ramjan Miller, for the opening remarks. Most esteemed guests, panelists, and delegates, greetings in St. LaSalle. It is such an honor to have you here on the last leg of the panel discussion, which is the Global Affairs Forum, and we can't wait to kickstart it today, especially that we have prepared a powerful set of speakers in our event. We are here to welcome various public servants, diplomats, government officials, and even a member of the Malaysian royal family. It is really heartfelt to know that our speakers invested their time to be part of our initiative and of course to you our dearest delegates for ensuring that you will be able to support and participate in the wonderful insights that they will impart later therefore dearest delegates we are expecting you to not just listen and to watch what the panelists are going to do and demonstrate but rather be an engaged delegate be active, be proactive in regards to the topics that they have prepared because we are going to tackle the various trends regarding youth's employability. We are here to hear from our dearest panelists about various current affairs regarding the changes in the career paths that we are about to face once we graduate from higher education. And most of all, we are here to restore hope in the fact that despite the ongoing pandemic happening and it seems like it is hopeless to find a job, it's time to actually be fearless and to realize that there are various institutions and various groups in the public sector that are willing to share what they have in store for us in our session. 
as we reach the last part of the 4C ASEAN Youth Career Summit, Lands and I look forward to ensuring that we will all feel fulfilled and fortunate enough to grab this opportunity. So I now give the mic to my fellow project director, Lance Chua. Thank you for that, uh, Ms. Romjan Miller. Uh, so yeah, good day, delegates. This is the very final session for our summit. And I just want to thank everyone who has helped us reach this far. So first and foremost, I would like to thank God for blessing us this momentous event with prestigious speakers, uh, very hardworking organizers, and of course, uh, um, multicultural delegates. Thank you as well to our hardworking team heads and associates working so hard to make this summit this world class. I would also like to thank our co-host, ASEAN Youth Advocates Network, for providing us a massive amount of assistance and the Southeast Asia Global Affairs Network that provided us, uh, that provided us with their excellent hosting and moderating for our panel discussions. And lastly, I would also like to thank uh, my partner, not just in the summit, but also in life, Ms. Ramjan Miller, for achieving this prestigious and one of the most successful summit ever. We have went through so much challenges, but I believe that we have successfully endured them and came out as a stronger, as a stronger couple. So delegates, please listen well, as this is the final leg of our summit. Thank you so much. Thank you for those incredibly insightful opening remarks. So for me to begin our very first ASEAN Youth Career Summit, may we call on Jairus Anno to lead us in our opening prayer. Next slide, please. Sorry. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dearest Father in Heaven, we are grateful for your everlasting support for our summit to be successful and phenomenal. You have been our guiding light in reaching out to our brothers and sisters of the ASEAN region as we welcome new knowledge and understanding of the future of work in our journey after college. We are humbled and blessed to be your instruments of professional development as we are reminded to work in good faith and in accordance to your teachings. Our love for business and diplomacy has been shaped by your compassion for us as your children. May we all continue to thrive as one ASEAN community. St. John Baptist de La Salle, pray for us. Live Jesus in our hearts forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much for that, Jairus. Moving forward, we will now be calling on Nadia La Sikora to sing the Philippine National Anthem. Let us put our right hand on our chest as we pay tribute to our host country. Bayang magiliw, kalas ang sinanganan, alam ng puso sa hindi buhay. Luhang hihirang, buhetan ang mahitin, sa
Let us sing another anthem in honor of the ASEAN and their socioeconomic contributions for our community and the youth. Thank you, dear Lassie Parang, for that wonderful performance. Proceeding with our event, we would like to invite Maya Luga and Kobe Lopez to introduce our esteemed panelists and speakers who will be joining us today's Global Affairs Panel. For our esteemed speakers, we have His Highness Tungko Zain al Ibiding Ibni Tuang Kumulis. He is a founding president of the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs in Malaysia. He is also the pro-chancellor of UCSI University. He has an honorary major in the Malaysian Territorial Army. He is also a trustee of Yayasan Munara, Yayasan Chalkit, and the Jeffrey Chia Foundation. He previously worked at the British Parliament World Bank, United Nations Development Program, and Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. He studied Bachelor of Government in Sociology and Masters of Comparison, Politics, and Imperial History in London School of Economics and Political Science. And we also have Assistant Secretary Eduardo Minez. He is the Assistant Secretary of the Office of Public and Cultural Diplomacy in the Department of Foreign Affairs. He is the former Deputy Chief of Mission in the Philippine Embassy to Japan. He was also the former Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary in the Philippine Emb Embassy to the Islam Republic of Iran, Tehran, and, I and Iran. He is also a recipient of the National Council for United Nations Peace Operations Award. He studied Masters of Advanced Studies in International and European Security Policy. Joining them are Her Excellency Maria Therese Bison de Vega. She is the Ambassador Designate at the Philippine Embassy in Seoul at the Republic of Korea. She was the former Ambassador to the Federal Republic of Germany in Berlin. She is the former Consul General the Philippine Consulate General in New York, and the former Vice Chair at the Philippine Center Management Board in New York. And she graduated BA English Cum Laude at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and Juris Doctor at Ateneo de Manila University School of Law. Next, we have Assistant Secretary Marianne Jocelyn Tirol Ignacio. She is the Executive Director and Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Office of ASEAN Affairs of the Department of Foreign Affairs. She is the former Consul General to the Philippine Embassy in Tokyo, Japan. She is the former Executive Director of the Office of the United Nations and other international organizations of the DFA. And she was previously assigned to the Philippine Embassy in Stockholm. She has published Partnering for Change, Engaging the World, the Philippines' Chairmanship of the ASEAN's Golden Year, and the Paghahanda sa Kalamidad, Gabay para sa mga lider ng komunidad. She is a graduate of the University of the Philippines Diliman and a Shevening Scholar for, for, for Foreign Service Program at Oxford University. And we have Mr. Wilmer uh, Carlo B. Pasage. He is the Labor and Employment Officer at the Bureau of Local Employment. He is part of the Employment Service Policy and Regulations Division of the Bureau. He is technical staff in various free trade agreements, including ASEAN, 
and he finished his bachelor's degree in international studies at Far Eastern University. Last but not least, we have our keynote speakers, Mr. Mufli Dwifikri. He is the founder and chief executive officer of the Global Millennial Group. He is also the executive director of Ikatan Mahasiswa Berprestasi UNS. He is the founder of the UNS Model United Nations Club. He was the former vice chair of the Philippines International Model United Nations, and he studied international relations in Universitas Sabeles Meret. We also have Mr. Morris Fidelli. He is the project lead at the Thrive Project. He is also the former chief executive officer and chief technology officer of Providence Solutions Corporation. He was the former managing director at Techmark Odyssey World. He is also a doctoral researcher on sustainable business innovation strategies at the University of Southern Queensland. He is also the lecturer at Queensland University of Technology. And of course, Her Excellency Vice President Lenny Robredo. She is the 14th incumbent Vice President of the Philippines. She is a former representative of Camarines Sur's 3rd District at the House of Representatives. She is also the former Vice Chairman of the House of, of, of the House Committees on Good Governance, Public Accountability, and Revision of Laws. She is the author of the Full Disclosure Policy Bill, People Empowerment Bill, Participatory Budget Process Bill, and the Comprehensive Anti-Discrimination Bill. She is a key supporter of the Freedom of Information Bill. She sponsored the House version of Republic Act RA10708, the Tax Incentive Management and Transparency Act of 2009. She, co she also co-authored the Anti-Dynasty Bill and, and Healthy Beverage Options Act. She studied Bachelor on Economics in the University of the Philippines Diliman and Law in the University of Nueva Cáceres. Without further ado, we will now be proceeding to our keynote speeches. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So for the short introduction first, my name is Mufli Dwi Fikri. You can call me Fikri. I'm come from Indonesia and currently I'm the CEO of Global Millennial Group of usually we call it GMG. So GMG itself is a startup company, an international startup company where we are focused in informal education and also soft development solutions. So we provide a lot of classes, soft skill classes, like a public speaking class, entrepreneur class digital marketing and we also are holding several international events like a submit conference SAM UN, and so on and so forth currently until today we already empower more than 200,000 youth from 37 countries so the topic is very interesting when the committee say to me talk about the future goal of the Asian youth itself so we must understand first the potential of the Asian or Southeast Asia region in general. So we must understand that Southeast Asia is a one of the most, the fastest growth uh, regions currently. So several countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, and actually almost all the Asians member is growing very fast in any terms, especially in terms of economy. So we can see it from the growth of the startup itself. The startup company in Southeast Asia, some of them already become a unicorn in three under five years. It's a very uh, vast uh, growth, actually. Even though we must admire that our region is not as fast as like China or US or India, but the thing is really not bad. We have a lot of potential. Now the question is, what is uh, the growth of the youth? How the future of the youth itself in the professional terms? Okay, here's, here's the thing. Today, we must change our mindset that we're not only following what our previous generation have done. Why? Because we are in the new era, especially uh, after the pandemic, after the COVID-19 situations. The acceleration of digitalization is a very fast. So everything uses technology, like you, you do today. So currently, I'm using technology. I use a camera. And then you see my video using 
the technology also and using the internet. So if you ask, what is what is actually the goal of the youth is use enhance the technology. And disclaimer first, a technology is not only in a very little development of technology like the coding, create a website, a software development, it's not only that. It's a part of environment. That's why a startup uh, is a very fast growing. So uh, in the technology environment, there is a lot of potential job. For example, like a business development, product development, the public relation itself, and then uh, for example, in terms of social media, in terms of marketing, we have now a social media specialist. Even though it's a social media specialist can divide it into several divisions, like the content writer, the visualizations, the quality control division, and so on and so forth. So, so the thing is, here's the thing, guys. So if you want to be compete in these current situations, in these current competitions, where we have actually a free trade, which is it's a free competition. So the thing is, if you're Philippines, you will not only have the competitions with the Philippines, with the Philippines, I mean, but you will also compete uh, with Indonesian, with a Malaysian, even though even uh, some of uh, Indian people, Russian people, and all of the world. So. The thing is, you must be a very progressive in your self-development and you must be mastering uh, some of new skill. The thing is, my suggestion is, you must be play, you must be enhance your soft skill in terms of technology, in any terms, in any terms. I mean, like, you uh, mastering the social media, mastering the digital marketing, mastering a millennial entrepreneurship. Why? Don't follow what, okay, don't follow what our previous generation has done. Why? Because the market is very different. Like our previous generation is uh, thinking about the banking, mining, maybe going to as the government officer, and so on and so forth. Okay. The thing is, if you want to become like again the government officer and so on and so forth, you must be the new generation of them. Don't become the only the previous quote unquote generations. You must bring something new. You must. Uh, bring technology into your life that's the first thing so mastering about technology in any aspect it not it's not only about coding create a website software development but in any terms the second the second is about your intrapersonal skills why again like i said after the pandemic this is uh, this is actually my prediction yeah people will be very comfort with the online situations like uh, having interaction with Zoom or, or the Google Meet or any other uh, video conference platform. The thing is, uh, the way, the technique of you have the intrapersonal skill, it will be very different from two, three years ago before the pandemic, right? So two, three years ago, uh, we can meet a people offline, not in a virtual way. Our interaction is a directly. Now we have indirect interaction. So you must have that those of the skill. Be remember, if you want to compete in any situation, you must have connection. And to create that connection is not easy, right? So you must uh, be understand. You must be mastering it. And then, actually, a lot of a lot of things that you can do as the youth, as the Asian. Uh, the third one, you must be borderless. This is actually our uh, what our company. I said to the you, right? So you must be a very borderless. You must out of your limit. So I don't know what happened in the Philippines or maybe in other country, but Indonesia itself, for example, I think the example of Indonesia, uh, people youth usually just a convert or maybe just afraid to out of their comfort zone. So for example, is is. It's very often happen in Indonesia. Ah, okay, I'm confident in uh, this situation. I don't want to go international. I don't want to A, B, C, D, E. Okay, I just want to be A. It, it is enough for me and so on and so forth. The thing is, that's okay, but I will not really recommend it. So, again, you will compete uh, with people from all around the world. So the thing is, if you're very comfortable with your zone right now, you're comfortable with what you have done right now, so you can be 
uh, you can be out of the competition suddenly. So maybe your positions can be changed by robots. You, it can be changed by technology and so on and so forth. So that's the thing. So you, this is also for the next tip. Make sure you as the human have the uniqueness. It's all about innovations actually. So as the youth, make sure that you always bring innovations, bring creative idea, bring anything that can help you compete in this uh, very competitive situations, right? So I mean like, you know, Elon Musk from the US, almost all of the, uh, how do I say, systematic works is done by the robots. So, so the thing is, you must become the person that cannot be replaced by the robots. And how you can do it? Be always different, be always innovative, be always creative every single day. So make sure what you do, what your skill is not something that template, quote unquote. So for example, you just become administration or you just become the public relation that just send email to a lot of partners. Believe me, it will be replaced with the robot with the technology in, uh, in the future. So the thing is, your skill must be unique. You must be giving a human touch in every, uh, uh, every job you have done. And also uh, for the next step. So the, the question will become, so how can I have uniqueness? How can I have uh, the personal value that can be changed by the robot? So you must uh, take every opportunity in your face. I mean, like a lot of opportunity, today. for example, internship, fellowship, student exchange, anything. Especially we, when we have a virtual, virtual situation where, where everything is virtual. You can take course in Harvard, uh, maybe in Oxford virtually. It's quite easier compared to two or three years ago when everything is offline, you must go to US or you must go uh, uh, to UK for having that course, you, uh, having that uh, knowledge and so on and so forth. Now currently we, have, we can have it easily. But the thing is you must uh, very, uh, you must take every opportunity in your face. Take internship, courses, short course, anything, virtually. And disclaimer, not disclaimer actually. The fact is uh, a lot of opportunity that I have it for free. <laughs> so what are you waiting for? The thing is all of them, all of them, all of the summary of uh, my speech is on me. Man. This is actually also the motto uh, that hold by my company. Uh, this is the quote from the Zig Ziglar, an American uh, writer. He said that you don't have to be great to start, but you have to start to be great. The thing is, you, you don't need to wait until you become the smartest people. You don't need to wait until you have become the greatest people. Why? Because you will not achieve it if you not start it. So be borderless, be brave to order your comfort zone, Try everything, apply, become a unique person, bring innovative in every single opportunity. Thank you, and I hope you with a nice day. Two of the most important issues facing society today in this post-COVID era are education and employment. Hi, I'm Morris Fideli, a full-time recruiter at the International for Impact Thrive Project. Over the last 35 years, I've hired thousands as leader of various startups through to being vice chair of organizations with over 37,000 members across three continents. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goal, or SDG 4, deals with addressing quality education and lifelong learning. SDG 8 addresses the ability for all of us to have decent work and fruitful lives. It promotes sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth full and productive employment and decent work for all. These are rights that many of us expect, yet Target 8.6 of the SDG 2030 agenda states that by 2020, yes, that was last year, we should have substantially reduced the proportion of youth, not in employment, education or training, set to be achieved through Indicator 56, which measures youth employment rate by formal and informal sectors. So how have we been performing? An International Labour Organization report on SDG 8 shows that less than half of the objectives have been attained, 
and that even be and that's even before COVID became an issue in 2020. Counterintuitively, it is believed that COVID is having a positive effect on the decent work agenda by raising awareness of the issues and positively impacting job creation. Currently, roughly half of the world's population, including most from Southeast Asian countries, live on $2 US a day. SDG 8 sees that every country provides its citizens the ability to have a good life, irrespective of their background, race or culture, although having a job does not guarantee the ability to escape from poverty. With GDP rates growth over the last few years of less than 4.8% year on year, and uh, less than the 7% growth rate targeted in SDG 8, coupled with the COVID-19 pandemic, we are heading for the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. SDG 4 champions universal access to quality education, with a call to all nations to allocate around 5% of their GDP and at least 15% of their expenditure towards SDG 4 targets for education. Yet, as of 2019, June, there are 750 million illiterate adults, half of which are based in Southeast Asia, well short of the target. Furthermore, based on Indicator 4B, it was envisaged that by now, we should have substantially expanded globally the number of scholarships available for developing countries. As stewards of this planet, we must support the youth to build a better future through inclusive education and decent employment and career development opportunities. Therefore, on behalf of the youth, it requires number one, empowerment. The road to success is long, requires passion, persistence and perspiration. Yes, that means hard work. Number two, determination. Learn how to make an impact and build a better future for all. Uh, whenever we face adversity, therein lies an opportunity to do better. And number three, opportunity. With inclusiveness in education, opening up doors to more prospects, in other words, career development, always aim to be the best at what you do. So you're probably wondering by now, how can you get ahead? Maga kabataan, gusto nyo malaman kung ano ito, di ba? How? Let me tell you. It starts with taking ownership of your situation. So I have four steps for you. One, become entrepreneurial. Increased unemployment rates have seen a rise in entrepreneurship in millennial youth. The United Nations has developed a framework to address the growing interest by millennials into entrepreneurship. In supporting young entrepreneurs, distinguished professors from our team propose a range of business models for sustainable innovation. Check out the article on fostering sustainable innovation through young entrepreneurship online from our blog series. Number two, develop skills and experience. Will's theory is essential in many roles on the uh, job experience is necessary to truly give you the breadth of exposure, develop team building skills, shape your acumen, develop your confidence and cement your ability to deliver what is required on time and to specification in a commercial setting. Take part in reputable volunteering and internship programs. In many cases, it will deliver your dream full-time role. Number three, obtain higher training. Make learning a lifelong objective. You are only as good as your knowledge allows you to be. Standards of education are increasing and your aim is to be in the top percentile thereby placing you ahead of the masses. Develop your skills and competencies in adjacent fields, thereby being able to offer a more rounded expertise. Make your own customized scholarship program for yourself. Number four, develop your network. Who you know can often be far more valuable than what you know, or kakilala. Take the time to develop your network of contacts via on-the-job placement and social media. Cast a wide net and get to know others from all walks of life. Whenever you can, seek out mentors and supporters. You can do all of these activities concurrently. Uh, great opportunities exist in this post-COVID world for those who are willing to learn uh, the skills to develop a social or environmental enterprise focused on solving some of our current pressing worldly challenges. Think climate change, epidemics, carbon emissions, uh, water management and purification, uh, brain-computer interface, uh, robotic surgery, 
uh, food security solutions, improving crop yields, uh, solar nuclear energy, extending the frontiers of space, and many, many more. Entrepreneurs leverage education and generate employment for themselves and the communities around them. As a final thought, I appreciate that volunteering is one of the best ways to get started and achieve long-term employment. It gives you varied work experience in a commercial setting and allows you to gain career building skills, access to a network of contacts and mentors, as well as ongoing training programs. Like most of the successful people in this world, dare to challenge the norm, be innovative, join leading organizations in developing solutions for a more prosperous future. Thank you. Hello to the participants of today's ASEAN Youth Career Summit. Thank you to the De La Salle Model United Nations Community and to your partners, the ASEAN Youth Advocates Network and Southeast Asia Global Affairs Network for organizing and hosting this event. It always gives me joy to see the youth engaging each other to tackle society's issues, constantly creating spaces like this where we can come together exchange ideas, and collaborate to bring our region to even greater heights. The pandemic continues to reshape our lives. As new variants of the virus emerge, cases continue to rise every day, putting the healthcare system under immense strain. Economies are still struggling to stay afloat, and Filipino families edge closer to poverty and hunger as the pandemic disrupts their source of livelihood. As young people, I know you feel these changes as well. Coming here today, I know you will have questions. What kind of career awaits me at the end of this pandemic? How do we become effective diplomats, policymakers, and advocates in the face of a crisis this magnitude? How do we begin? Where are we most needed? There are no easy ready-made answers to these questions. And each of us will reflect on this in our own way. But if there is anything that this pandemic has taught us, it is that we are all interconnected. The suffering of one redounds to the suffering of all. Just as the progress of the last, the least, and the lost redounds to the progress of all. Cooperation, as well as the passion for entrepreneurship and diplomacy that is already shared within this community is what will see us through. Today, we reflect on how our actions create ripples that go well beyond our immediate circles, wider and wider, until we come to understand how the fate of the entire human race is intertwined. By being here, we reaffirm the idea, the only way through any challenge is to band together. Your generation will do so much more than help us meet the demands of the present and plan our next steps as we rebuild our future. As industries all over the world adapt to the new realities that this pandemic has brought upon us, you will create new policies, practices, and procedures that are safe, ethical, and sustainable. Your generation will carry on the spirit that is needed to sustain many struggles, advancing gender equality, protecting the environment, and freeing people from hunger and poverty among them. Together, we can reach our collective aspirations, not only for our region, but for the whole of humanity. The task now is to look for more of us, more of us to do the work, more innovators, trailblazers, and change makers like you to forge new paths and chart the best way forward. This is the best place to start. As young leaders and participants in this event, you are in a unique position to learn and collaborate with your peers. Keep engaging, keep moving with others, keep widening and strengthening your networks. Use your learnings to serve your communities better. Continue to have meaningful conversations, both online and offline. Every effort counts. 
There are no insignificant gestures. Always remember, you are not mere spectators or leaders in the making. Even now, you are already partners in the work to achieve humanity's goals. You are citizens of the world, young leaders with the capacity to chart a better and more sustainable path to the future, forging a society that is fairer and kinder, one that is more compassionate, more humane, and more inclusive. With you among our ranks, I have faith that we can and will realize the future of our hopes. Thank you. Mabuhay kayong lahat. Wow, what inspiring words from our panel, from our speakers just now. Actually, Mr. Morris Fideli is uh, virtually with us today on Zoom net right now. Um, let us give a virtual round of applause to acknowledge his presence. Welcome, Mr. Uh, Morris Fideli. Uh, welcome you. We welcome you to, to join us today on this event. Um, Andy, any remarks on the speeches just now? It's truly amazing how everyone from multiple areas of the globe came together to deliver a timely and insightful messages to us and our dear delegates. I especially like the common theme of inclusivity and being united, yet unique as the youth. We truly hold the future in our hands as aspiring diplomats or policy makers, especially as we recover during the phase of the pandemic. What about you, Simon? Yeah, those are, those are indeed wise words, I, and I agree with you. And I also think that the speeches were a perfect start for our upcoming panel discussions. From Mr. Fakri's words of encouragement and tips to our youth to compete in this age of dis digitalization, to Mr. Fideli's highlighting uh, the stark realities of this lack of progress in the achievement of the SDGs, especially in the context of this unforeseen pandemic, and how youth can prepare ourselves for those challenges. To finally, Her Excellency Vice President um, Rob Redrow's emphasis on youth unity for the future. But hey, we're, we're just getting started here. At this point, let us get ready for the panel discussions. Dearest delegates, before we proceed, here's something for you to consider. What are you looking forward to hearing from our esteemed diplomats and government officials later today? Out of three, three topics that we're going to discuss, um, Diplomacy, especially in the context of COVID-19, uh, crisis uh, resolution or making or raising social awareness in your community, or you might be thinking of thinking about public service in a historical context. What are you feeling? What are you most excited about? Feel free to type them down in the comment below if you're from Facebook, or type write down a few words in the chat box if you're joining us from Zoom. Let's see how everyone feels and about the um, topics to be discussed today. Well, while that's going on, Andy, um, could I entertain you with a with a small fact that I found? Oh, sure. On ASEAN. Of course. Okay. Did you know that despite ASEAN being one of the most ethnically diverse um, regions in the world, it's economically uh, the people in it are economically as of as of one people. Let me explain. Let me elaborate what I mean. Ninety nine percent of the tariffs tariffs between ASEAN countries have already been eliminated, and it impl implies that we're on track to freely trade and support each other economically, like a economic web, as if we're one people under the identity of ASEAN. And I think that's the, what the youth have to. Keep in mind as well that we're one people that um, the future uh, depends on uh, depends on us. Um, let's let's check out some of the uh, comments if we have any of those. Um, no, it's really, they're really excited about the information that will be presented by our speakers. Actually, I am actually <laughs> impressed by our lineup for, for today. Let's give it a few more seconds. Looks like most people have chosen the, the default option, which I think is, mm -hmm. is uh, they're excited about all three topics. Yes, actually. Oh. Okay. 
we hope you all are excited as we are. So may we now call on Mr. Maris Pommel and Ms. Emily Nazaki, our moderators for this Global Affairs panel discussion. All right. Thank you so much for that, Andy and Simon. Good evening, everyone. I am Myris Ponon, the founder and chairperson of the CN Youth Advocates Network, the co-host of this year's AYCS, and I will be your moderator for this evening, and I am joined by no other than... Malina Zaki, your co-moderator and acting chairperson for the Southeast Asia Global Affairs Network. All right. Let's get the ball rolling. Hello to our participants via Zoom and via Facebook Live. You have heard amazing keynote speeches, and now we are into the meat of our summit. I hope you're excited, but before we get to you know, dive in, I'd like to ask all our participants, whether you're from Zoom or you're at uh, Facebook Live, I'd like to ask, how are you doing? And I want to know if you're ready. So if you are ready, I want you to comment down below that I am ready. Can I see a raise of comments? Can I see every all of our participants that are ready? I can see so many like Noel, Rochelle, Jose. We have so many individuals ready. And you know what? Let's begin. I guess all of you are ready. I am seeing a lot, hundreds of comments and Facebooks within seconds, even here via Zoom. So let's start. Our first topic for the panel discussion, as you see, is exploring the career paths in the ASEAN diplomatic sector during COVID-19. After all, it is crucial that diplomats know how to solve critical global issues, given the responsibility of their power and their representation of a nation, one of which was just aforementioned, COVID-19. They must also be aware of how to truly cater to a marginalized, to the marginalized around the globe and craft sustainable solutions for them in these issues. Because we want to create their goal at the end of the day is to, you know, craft policies, of course, especially for the most vulnerable. Right, Amelina? I totally agree with you, Myris. And I think these discussions definitely are timely. Without further ado, may we invite our panelists to join us as we head on to this discussion properly. To our speakers, thank you all so much again for being here with us today. So without further ado, let us begin. Our first question to start our first topic is this. What are the differences in your approaches between the day you began your diplomatic or governmental journey and your current one today? Again, what are the differences in your approaches between the day you began your, your job and compared to how you approach your job today? Anyone can take the floor first. Please feel free to, do, to unmute. Uh, shall, shall we begin? Um, Asik Ed, Asik Ed, do you want to take the floor? Asik Ed, do you want to take the floor? No, no, no. <laughs> Ladies first, please. <laughs> um, magandang, magandang gabi po sa inyong lahat. Good evening uh, to everyone. Um, Anyong Hashimnika from uh, from Seoul. It's uh, We're about an hour ahead of everyone. And from my previous post in Germany, uh, Guten Abend to everyone. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, to the um, organizers and everyone who has supported the um, holding of the ASEAN Youth Career Summit 2021. Uh, it, it's really a privilege and an honor to uh, be with um, a very young um, and um, an inspiring and very eager audience, and also to be on the same panel with um, colleagues from the Department of Foreign Affairs, whose uh, whose uh, commitment to public service um, I know very well, I know firsthand, and also to um, other distinguished speakers um, on the panel. Uh, thank you very much. Um, how has diplomacy changed? I have to tell you, and this is what I share um, on on the many occasions where I've been asked to to speak. Um, 
uh, in, in, in similar, um, similar panels or, or settings is that I'm really an accidental diplomat. I started my professional career as um, an academic at the University of the Philippines, my alma mater. By the way, thank you to the um, DLSU for inviting an Atenean uh, to your forum. Very happy to be here. I've never had any real connections with the LaSalle um, family, but I do have a younger brother who was once a faculty member over at Taft. Uh, he's now in government, and he was uh, also a former uh, president of your student council, at DLSU. And um, my husband, who is also a diplomat, is a proud uh, LaSalle Green Hills graduate. And uh, I have a relative who used to head uh, LaSalle Green Hills, so that's about it. Uh, but thank you for inviting me. Um, as, as an accidental diplomat, um, as an academic, my, my approach to, uh, to the start of my diplomatic career, I think like many or, or at least some of my colleagues, is really a by the book, by the playbook approach to diplomacy. Um, for my generation of diplomats, we started out as um, really proceeding from uh, a position where, and in a context where traditional diplomacy was still um, the paradigm for the day. Um, this was in the very early, this is in the early 90s, 93, 94, that particular era. But um, the world is constantly evolving and with it, diplomacy also needs to evolve. Some will say that diplomacy um, doesn't evolve as quickly as the world. We're always a few steps behind. And in many cases that that could be true, but also I think that um, we've made some great strides over the years and personally, um, my, my personal focus on my work as a diplomat has also evolved um, from, um, you know, the more traditional um, areas of diplomacy like security and political diplomacy um, to um, actually a broader view of, of the role and, and more um, advocacy in terms of economic diplomacy, but even economic diplomacy has changed. Um, we not only um, promote um, you know, main, uh, you know, very major industries, but also emerging industries in our work, like the startup and innovation sector, um, social enterprises, for example. I think these are uh, important um, emerging areas. Um, also heritage diplomacy, which I think is very important for any ASEAN diplomat. That's my own term. Um, Assistant Secretary Menyes uh, and our colleagues, we, we normally use cultural diplomacy, but I've sort of made my own, I've added a little bit, I've made it a little uh, wider in scope and I'm calling it heritage diplomacy. And um, climate diplomacy is a, now a very important part of our work. And, um, and because, not only because of the pandemic, but it started way before the pandemic, but it's been highlighted and I think accelerated because of the pandemic, digital diplomacy. And uh, just a tip for, for our audience, for our participants, um, not just in the Philippines, but in other parts of the world. Um, if you have the chance, there is a very interesting speech delivered by the former um, foreign minister of India, uh, Nirupama Rao. And it's actually, she actually condensed it. It was a speech before the UNESCO and she condensed it. She has um, a published shorter form of her speech on the importance of digital diplomacy. Um, in a very in a very fast changing world, uh, which um, which uh, appears in in publication form, I think Forbes um, has has a version of that, uh, the shorter version, wherein she said that um, for diplomats in the twenty first century, we ignore um, the the benefits and the constructive um, use and presence of digital diplomacy, of social media, of new media at our peril. And, and I subscribe to that fully. I think if properly managed and uh, used constructively, digital diplomacy, um, you know, to, to address um, uh, emerging concerns um, and crisis uh, management, for example, is a very important tool. And of course, for a Filipino diplomat also, it's very important for frontline diplomacy, which is really the human face, the public face of diplomacy. And these are the services that we render to, 
to um, our nationals overseas if we're assigned overseas and also in the Philippines as we do our public service work. Um, you know, the daily consular services, passports, visas, authentication, legalizations, um, all these things, um, these are very important tools. So diplomacy has changed. It is constantly changing. And I think we just have to be nimble, nimble enough and flexible enough um, not to lose ourselves in the midst of the changes, but to manage um, the changes um, constructively. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Vega, who would like to um, be next. Anyone can take the floor. <laughs> uh, okay, well, let, let me uh, just add a little more and uh, thank you again to the organizers and to all the participants around the end. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to be on the panel with my colleagues from the Department of Foreign Affairs and, and others as well from around the region. Uh, with regard to your question, um, well, similar to what uh, Ambassador Tess de Vega mentioned, uh, I have been with the Department of Foreign Affairs uh, coming up to 30 years now. So when I joined the department, uh, uh, mobile phones were not yet so uh, common. Uh, you would have those large brick uh, phones that you would carry around and we used uh, pagers, I think, to communicate. So uh, that gives you an idea of how it was uh, before. Uh, in particular, also the, the, the uh, pay scale was much uh, more modest uh, when I entered. But certainly uh, the challenges of serving uh, in the Foreign Service, in the Department of Foreign Affairs. And this applies across ASEAN. Uh, similarly, uh, in the foreign ministries of the other ASEAN countries, uh, all diplomats face similar um, types of work, uh, in particular because ASEAN, uh, we're all developing countries. Uh, well, maybe except for Singapore, which is considered to be a developed uh, country uh, 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 in terms of uh, the economy. But uh, because of our uh, situations, a lot of uh, the ASEAN member states do have their nationals abroad, in particular Indonesia uh, and uh, also uh, in Thailand, you have other neighboring Indo-Chinese uh, uh, countries, nationals working in Thailand, and also other nationals working in Singapore and working in uh, Malaysia. So uh, as was mentioned, uh, dealing with the um, public, the, our nationals is an important part of the work that has remained but the way we deal with it uh, has changed. Uh, as was mentioned, the advent of technology has made communication much more easy. And uh, therefore, we are able to learn about problems much quicker, either through uh, the social media uh, platforms, which uh, many of our foreign service posts have, whether it be uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, or even Viber and WhatsApp. So we are notified much quicker, and we are also able to um, uh, address the questions and the needs of our nationals much quicker because of the technology that now exists. Uh, and that, of, of course, also links to the first keynote speaker uh, and his uh, focus on, on continually improving yourself so that you um, are uh, keep abreast of the technology that is available that will make your work easier uh, and as it has done for diplomacy as well. Um, the other aspects where I think uh, diplomacy has changed from the time that I entered to now is also th uh, the fact that we are again, because of technology, much more um, integrated and uh, global. So again, when, when I entered in the early 90s, uh, a lot of the discussions and the, 
and the issues were focused on uh, national, national interests, national issues. Um, but through the years, uh, again, because of technology and communication and the ease of travel, uh, many issues are no longer uh, of a uh, what we call um, state, uh, only state-centered. But now we are also uh, talking about human security. So issues like climate change, uh, trafficking, migration, uh, all these uh, global issues that are better understood and more uh, discussed. Uh, and because we are a globalized world, um, all the opportunities for the youth have also expanded. And, and this was also touched upon by the keynote speakers. So uh, no longer are you restricted to looking for work within your country. Um, many uh, universities now offer courses in international studies, interdisciplinary studies, um, and offer uh, postgraduate courses uh, for international students. Um, so because of all this uh, interrelationship and integration, uh, the, the field of discussion within diplomacy has expanded and uh, has also uh, made uh, people within countries more aware of issues outside of their own uh, country. Uh, so again, uh, as, as the next generation uh, of leaders, uh, it is really important to, to know more about the world and not just focus on your own uh, national uh, issues. So I'll, I'll end it at that at this point. Thank you so much, Assistant Secretary Mendez. I guess now we can give the floor to His Highness, Tung Kuzain Abidin. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, thanks. I didn't chime in earlier because I'm not really a, uh, a diplomat in the conventional sense that the others on this panel are. Uh, nor am I really a government representative. So my hat is more on the uh, civil society side of things. How, you know, obviously there is a lot of inter uh, with diplomats, uh, with, represent with, with ministers and, and the civil service. Um, and the diplomacy goes, it's always been a very important, those events that we do, uh, those channels that we have in speaking to um, ambassadors, the diplomatic ranks, um, at least here in Malaysia, um, the, the level of interaction that they have had with uh, civil society has really, um, civil society in Malaysia has really grown in the view in the Philippines will be very aware of this. The, the status of some very lucky in the sense that um, as, as ideas, the democracy economic affairs are uh, um, we also managed to take on um, interactions with different uh, government and different political parties. Uh, but, and, and it's really been um, until COVID, right? That uh, expectation of interaction has really become solidified. Uh, 10 years ago, I think independent think tanks, uh, different kinds of NGOs were not really established. And people were wondering, you know, what really should the role be? How do civil society organizations feed into public policy making? But I think we've now reached an equilibrium where there is an expectation that if there's going to be a new policy, civil society will be involved. If there's going to be a new announcement, uh, the diplomatic community will have a view about it. Um, and of course, um, as the diplomats 
will know. Um, you know, some some countries um, have more forceful views, have more uh, forceful ways of saying things, uh, particularly if there are um, national other competing national interests or geopolitical interests at stake. And so the role of civil society has been very important in um, moderating that, you know, serving as a platform which is neutral, not really officially, you know, representing a government line, but not really, but not really taking sides between geopolitical uh, competition either. So um, that's always been the case, uh, you know, that's the story of the development of civil society over the last 10 years. Now, until COVID, um, there's uh, now there's been, like as with everything else, um, and here I refer back to some of the, the uh, points made in the keynote speeches, um, being able to shift to conducting these same things uh, online, um, being able to, it, it's really taken a lot of effort to uh, maintain those, um, uh, co that, those collaborative links. Uh, again, as I'm sure the diplomats will tell you, um, one of the key things about diplomacy and networking is this, those national days, right? Those national days, those cocktail events, or those, you know, canopy events. And, you know, you, you, you meet people by chance, you make connections, and that's how a lot of, of the, you know, soft diplomacy uh, takes place. Uh, so it's been a challenge to, to maintain those links and maintain those efforts in the COVID world. But as we hopefully move uh, post COVID, uh, we will be able to um, keep those lessons that we've learned while embrace uh, all the benefits from before once again. So that's my answer there. Thank you. Thank you so much, His Highness um, Tunku Zain Habidin, for giving us a perspective of civil society being uh, very relevant, of course, when it comes to um, affairs such as this, as part that promotes and amplifies participatory governance and you know, Amalina and I are actually part of civil society as um, representatives of a nonprofit, and it really means a lot to hear from you. Next, we can go on to Mr. Pasage, Wilmer Pasage. Good evening. Hello, good evening. Thanks, Myrus. And good evening to all the delegates uh, here present today, virtually, of course. And can I just say that I'm really honored to be uh, a member of the panel with such a uh, high level of personality from uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and of course, uh, his Highness, uh, Mr. Tunku. So uh, probably my um, view will be from a uh, perspective of a slightly younger uh, individual in the public service. And, um, and I'm also here uh, representing on behalf of Assistant Secretary uh, Dominic Rubia Dubai, who is uh, not a diplomat, but a, mem um, a member of the Philippine delegation when it comes to uh, free trade agreements. So, yeah. So prior to the pandemic, uh, forging new and nourishing alliances in various frontiers entails conducting and attending various face-to-face -face meetings with counterparts around the globe. However, the advent of COVID-19 forced the reliance on the internet, which paved the way for a new approach in communication. So the internet uh, ubiquity uh, bridged the gap on distance uh, to demonstrate uh, the recently concluded uh, Asia, uh, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Senior Officials Meeting. Uh, it's traditionally conducted uh, wherein the leaders and the member of the delegation uh, go to the host country where, whereby series of meetings are conducted. So at the onslaught of the COVID-19, uh, this forum shifted to the use of online communication, uh, whereby attendees get to participate in the discussion while in the comfort of their countries and in the comfort of their homes. Uh, who would have thought that an organization that big can meet online during the pandemic? So from a perspective of the Department of Labor and Employment, uh, we still continue to meet our stakeholders, uh, which are the employers and the labor sectors uh, online. So information dissemination and capacity building uh, mechanism are all done online and the pandemic will not stop us in reaching our people to deliver the best public service. So, and also Myris, I will share to uh, the delegates the current uh, situation of our uh, industry and the labor market right now. So, 
as you may know, uh, we are now in the fourth industrial revolution, shifting, almost shifting to 4.5 or 5. Uh, this, uh, this is also known as the digital age or the digital era, wherein the use of technology is already essential to our lives, whether it is on our personal lives, on our work, or, or other matters that we want to do. Uh, the technology is always uh, there. So I'll give you uh, three examples of, of uh, this, which, which are the Internet of Things, Machine Learning, and Data Analytics. So in the Internet of Things, uh, one example would be the Apple iCloud, uh, in, wherein the um, technologies are somehow talking to each other. So uh, if you have a MacBook and you have, um, you have an iPhone, you can control um, you can control the sound or the music and the documents in your uh, iPhone using your uh, MacBook. So somehow you're not controlling your, your iPhone, but you're controlling your laptop, and they're the ones communicating to each other. And next is the uh, machine learning. Uh, examples of this are the chatbot, wherein um, we can um, inquire or we can ask um, Certain, uh, um, we can ask a uh, virtual. We can ask the artificial intelligence on what we what we want to know, and and the the in the technology triggers the answers. Uh, wherein we input, wherein we, well, uh, we input the answers, and then when a certain question is raised to the the chatbot. Uh, it somehow um what do you call this uh, it will relay the answers to you without any any person controlling it and the last one is the uh, data analytics uh, this is from a business perspective uh, data interpretation by the use of computers and uh, which cannot be done by um, a regular uh, person well it can be done by a person but it will take a longer time to complete uh, the processing of uh, the data. So uh, in connection to uh, labor and employment uh, in this uh, industrial or industrial revolution is that we need to reskill our labor force. And for the students, like most of the attendees here and um, fresh graduates or future graduates, we need to upskill in order for you to cope with the current um, labor market, it doesn't necessarily mean that if you're a graduate of, let's say, international studies or political science, it is now somehow mandatory that you know certain basic knowledge on computers or, or data management. That, and, of course, to improve your uh, soft skills. So, does that mean, Wilmer, does that mean that um, if you do not have such skills, you will be laid off or you will be displaced from your job? Uh, no. So in order to cope in the fourth industrial revolution, you, um, should, know, you should know how to, to reskill and upskill, like what I've mentioned. Or, or in millennial terms, career shift. So um, you're not really switching from, from the traditional knowledge of your uh, previous work, but with, with, uh, while learning the new skills, let's say for data management, let's say during this, a uh, great example will be this pandemic, wherein uh, you're, you, lo you lose your current job uh, at this time. When you know that, uh, um, knowledge on data management. You can uh, switch companies or switch industries and you can apply um, for a new role or a new job uh, during this time while, while you're in, your, your, your comfort zone or, or your previous work is currently closed because of this crisis. So in relation, so we move to um, a, on the diplomatic side of this. So as a future diplomat, the delegates, or some of the delegates will be future diplomats, I suppose. Um, we need to always keep abreast 
with the global trends because as a diplomat we are the we are the bridge um we are bridging the gaps that will keep uh, the labor force uh, competitive and resilient especially in the times of disruption and economic shock such as um this pandemic so uh, if if you're if you will be somehow a future diplomat you will uh, the importance of uh, this is to um learn from uh, developed countries wherein you can apply those learning to the philippines in order to formulate um new policies that will help our country thrive uh, specifically uh in the labor force uh, in the philippines so i'll end there thank you mario thank you so much mr pasagi for answering that comprehensively and last but not the least may i call on assistant secretary tirol ignacio hi good evening it's such a pleasure to be here and i'd like to greet our hosts and wish you a really successful summit uh, as well as this particular forum and i have to say it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to be joined particularly by such an esteemed set of um, speakers and i found the conversation uh, that's ongoing really really interesting and i thought it really speaks about the development and the progress that diplomacy has been uh, engaged in for quite a period of time in fact um what was particularly interesting for me was the evolution uh, when we used to think of diplomacy as just the plain purview of ambassadors and it remains to be true to this day a large bulk of foreign affairs remain with the foreign affairs department and and their diplomats but it has evolved um all members or public sector in fact are engaged in it um we do have people from civil society who are engaged in it as well um it's interesting for me because in a way it kind of reflects the history of asean uh, in asean we started out having you know the bangkok declaration which was signed by our founding fathers who as it turns out were really foreign ministers no they weren't our heads of state or government eventually it evolved into a meeting or a set of meetings that included our leaders and that's when we started to have the asean summits so this is an indication for you that you know diplomacy has begun to expand itself to include our leaders as well where they became their main responsibility to be able to engage in you know foreign relations with other countries much as through their ambassadors and through their foreign ministers and then we find that when asean evolved and became a community then there was now meetings that involved um our sectoral bodies so in fact we have people from doh we have people from finance we have people from dpi from from dswd who would meet with counterparts and talk about their relations under asean and how to build um a an asean community so i think it's really fascinating and you know uh based on that i'll jump in and you know and get into um try to respond to the question that was earlier posed by our host and you know i i i think it's interesting that i i came into the department 25 years ago um at the time when the, the floor contemplation case had just had just arisen i i arrived in 1996 no and um at the time I, you know it was fascinating for me to be to be working in an office uh which was both office of asian pacific affairs i was uh, called a cadet at the time because we were still undergoing training and then i was also assigned to the office of the legal assistant for migrant workers affairs which is a very new office uh it was it was um constructed um uh, to respond to the to floor contemplation you no know, and the seat change that the foreign service had undergone uh because, because of this particular case and you know for me those were really formative years and um the way i saw it was that i perceived the department then at the time when there was in fact increased institutionalization of our work to assist our kababayans overseas um i think it had always been for a very long time one of the main pillars of philippine foreign policy was 
you know, to be able to promote the welfare of, of our Kababayans overseas. But I think when the floor contemplation case happened, what happened was we began to build up our institutions in this area and we began to provide more emphasis on how we can better help our Kababayans. So for me, I, I thought this was really such a fascinating development at such an early part of my career, particularly since I saw that because of what had happened domestically, there was a very discernible impact when it came to our relations with Singapore, which I might remind you was an ASEAN country and supposedly being part of the ASEAN family, we were supposed to be very close. So to have our um, diplomatic relations almost disrupted, I think was, was, was I think a very big lesson for me to learn early in a, the early part of my career. I, I wish to point out that in fact, when I entered the department, I had absolutely um, no background in, in foreign relations. Um, I took the foreign service examination and I passed it, but I really came from an art and education, um, you know, I came from the art and education field when I entered the DFA. I was previously working in the Ayala Museum as their education officer. And prior to that, I worked in the marketing division and was involved in the tour section. So my approach when I entered the department was very, very different, primarily because my experiences, the knowledge and the skills that I possessed, they were really geared more towards the audience uh, or towards the public um, um, with the attempt to try to make them understand and appreciate art and history and to try to bring them to a point where they could be interested in you know, delving deeper into the history and the story of things. So, at the time when I was with the Ayala Museum, I in fact worked in a very small office, you know, and with a very small group of people with, with their own distinct specialization. So everything was very personal. Everything was very familial. So you can imagine what it felt like when I entered the department. Suddenly, this was the big wide world before me, you know. It was a really big department. Um, we had so many offices there. And uh, I found myself in a new career track. Um, with, with very little background, aside from the fact that I was really very interested in politics. Uh, I, I read up on international relations. I was very interested in the world. Uh, but other than that, the work itself had escaped me. So until I began to work um, in, and took the foreign service exam. So I can say that based on my 25 years in the department, um, that in fact, nothing that I had gone through even the experience that I had gained when I was um, in the earlier part of my career, and even prior to that, when I worked in, in the Ayala Museum, everything has worked to come together to be able to make me an effective, and I would hope an interesting diplomat, you know. I, I find that we do need to call on all of these skills and all of these experiences to be able to promote and foster our relations with other countries. So diplomacy is really, an interesting career because it is multifaceted and you tend you will re represent the Philippines you know overseas and this will demand a lot from you it, it will demand a lot of skills a lot of talents a lot of interests so I, I think that more than anything it, it can be a very fulfilling career and the starting point for for diplomacy can come from anywhere in fact I, I think for me and I think for like Ambassador De Vego uh, that it's proof of that. But uh, I would also like to say that um, in the 25 years that I worked in the department, I have realized that you do need to hone your experiences and your skills. You have to keep your eye on the ball. To be a really excellent diplomat, you have to know and be aware of all the skills that you will be needing when you eventually become ambassador of our country. Because in the end, that's like the end goal. And when you have very concrete um, I think goals and objectives, then it helps you to develop into a better, a more focused diplomat. Then you know what skills to develop because you do need to develop skills. Um, it, it's, um, you do need to be um, understanding of the world. I have a term that I have read upon recently. It's called deep literacy. And this is true. We cannot afford to be shallow. You, you have to be able to delve into things to understand the world. And in doing that, then your approach becomes deeper and the relationship that you'll be able to forge on behalf of the Philippines with other countries will deepen as well. So I do believe that 
you know, abiding interests and experiences learned will remain with you for the rest of your life. And I think this can be a substantial resource to draw upon in the foreign service. Thank you so much, Assistant Secretary Terrell Ignacio. And to all our esteemed panelists for that wonderful start for our first topic. Amelina, would you like to start our next question? Yes, thank you, Myris. So the next question that I have for our esteemed speakers is, how have you dealt with communication conflicts with your stakeholders? Um, as from before, anyone is welcome to take the floor first. Melina, can I start? Yes, go yeah. ahead. Thank you. All right. So for the question, uh, how we dealt with communication conflicts with our stakeholders. So um, the stakeholders comprise of both the employer and the labor sector. So as, as we are the government agency mandated to maintain the harmonious relationship of both sectors, uh, we assure that our programs and policies are reflective of our stakeholders' welfare in view of the department's goals and vision to accord decent employment to affect the Filipino people. And despite uh, mo mobility restrictions aimed at curbing the spread of the virus, the Dolit the took advantage of the online space to bridge the gap on this restriction, thereby maintaining and improving uh, the quality of communication we have with our stakeholders and maintaining the tripartite uh, peace between the government, the employer, and the labor sector. Thank you. Thank you so much for your answer. Um, any other speaker would like to go first? Um, if I may. Yes. <laughs> oh, uh, enjoy or anyway, just, just briefly, because uh, the office that I, I head presently is the Office of uh, Public and Cultural Diplomacy. And uh, public diplomacy, of course, uh, means that we deal with the important stakeholders of the department, uh, the media, and the public. So, um, as you know, uh, one of the classical definitions of a diplomat is uh, as follows. Diplomacy is to do and say the nastiest things in the nicest way. So, <laughs> Uh, I guess it comes with the territory that, uh, you know, you have to have a very good, um, I guess, EQ and, and uh, patience in order to deal with uh, your stakeholders, especially when it comes to difficult uh, issues, questions that arise uh, about how things are being done and questions on policy. Um, so one of the things that uh, uh, a good diplomat uh, will need to develop is, is how to deal with uh, the public and uh, with stakeholders, uh, not only in the uh, more pleasant uh, situations as was uh, described by His Highness uh, cocktail parties, but even, you know, uh, more importantly, in dealing with uh, the difficult situations, uh, dealing with uh, abusive employers, uh, uh, you know, talking to people who have uh, uh, in, in crisis situations, um, very probing questions by the media about unpopular policies. So uh, you really do need, it's not something that you might be born with, although some people might have the gift of gab, um, but it is something that can be learned, can be developed. And so uh, similar to the other uh, statements before me, you really have to continue to improve your skills if you want to be a uh, competent diplomat. Thank you so much for your answer. Um, Assistant Secretary Tyrol Ignacio, would you like to go next? Just now you had your hand raised. 
Yes, thank you so much. Well, I will of course approach this question um, because coming from the Office of ASEAN Affairs, then I would like to talk about the ASEAN way. So the ASEAN way, as you're probably aware, has always been personal, you know. It's about communicating discreetly, quietly, pragmatically, by consultation, if not consensus. And I think this teaches you many lessons in easing conflict and promoting peace. So from a perspective of the relationships between nations, uh, my work in ASEAN has taught me that the importance of socializing norms and values can be an excellent foundation for excellent relations. Um, so if you have common values, then it goes a long way in terms of promoting, I think, um, communication and easing, and easing any conflict that exists. ASEAN has also taught me the wisdom of what you call strategic patience. You, you, cannot, have, you cannot have quick fix solutions for big problems immediately. And I know this is tragic because sometimes um, it really does take time for some changes to happen. And we want this to happen simply because lives can be lost. Um, you know, a lot of people can be hurt by, by certain situations. But, but I really do strongly believe that, that if you work hard at something, you may not get the immediate result that you want and be able to resolve the conflict immediately but you will eventually get there. So relationships and structures are also very relevant to easing conflict. So conflict can be eased if there is dialogue. So there has to be a conversation that's happening. So um, this will be easier to do if, um, let's say, um, um, if you have, for example, established relations beforehand. So th this is where I think um, at the micro level, you have to do a lot of networking. From a macro level, you know, you, you, you cannot have a relationship with a country if you don't establish diplomatic relations. So it's, it's something as practical as that. Um, also, in terms of structure, it's interesting for me that um, on the national level, the Office of ASEAN Affairs convenes what you call the ASEAN Matters Technical Board. This is like, um, it's a meeting, it's a structure that brings together the different government agencies on a quarterly basis to consult with them on various issues that are discussed and raised in ASEAN. Now, the fact that there is a structure that brings us together, you know, makes communication on the airing of any concerns built in, and it preempts or eases any kind of conflict that may arise. So, so this in a nutshell, based on what I do know from the work I've done in ASEAN, I think, I think these are very practical ways by which we can ease conflict and talk to our stakeholders. Um, I think communication is really the key. Thank you. Thank you, Assistant Secretary Tyrol Ignacio. Um, perhaps Ambassador Deveka, you'd like to go next? Yes, just, just to add to um, what my colleagues, um, Ambassador Menez and, and uh, Assistant Secretary um, Tyrol uh, mentioned. Um, you know, just like the first question, um, communications for um, in the world of diplomacy has changed, has evolved over the years. We have so many stakeholders now. Um, the it, it it has exploded actually to as many stakeholders as there are issues um, that that we confront on a daily basis, and um, it it. Uh, and we do have training for our diplomats on how to deal with certain situations. We, we do have training on um, building, building a, a good communications plan. But I think, again, the key here is, um, is knowing your audience, knowing the stakeholders you have to reach, and knowing how to deal with, with each specific audience. Like for um, uh, Joy mentioned earlier um, about how communication is, is done within the ASEAN context. Um, in, in our case, for example, if we're posted overseas, if we're part of a Philippine embassy or a consulate general, um, there are ways to deal with our bilateral partners, the country, the host government, for example, and also international um, organizations or entities. Uh, these follow a more traditional way of communicating and resolving uh, conflicts or reaching uh, an understanding on, on certain issues and, and matters on, on mutual concerns. Um, but at the same time, we also have other stakeholders. We have Filipino overseas. The way we deal 
uh, with this has been changing over the years. Um, I, re I recall I've, I've been in the service since since my colleagues have already said they've been there for 30 years, they've been there for 27. I'm, I'm, I think I'm, I'm about to reach my 29th year of, of service in the DFA. Um, before um, before the advent of social media and more advanced um, communication facilities and, and modalities um, for the community, for example, we would hold, um, I recall I was posted, oh, nearly two decades ago in Hong Kong at our consulate general in Hong Kong, where we have a sizable um, overseas community. We would hold regular leaders forums and small meetings. There would be the usual protest, um, which we, of course, um, uh, we, which we, of course, deal with also um, diplomatically, but we would have these modalities, we would call leaders forums, these would be on site meetings and we would have announcements, but now um, technology has allowed us to reach a wider audience um, at a much faster clip. Um, and so we're able to, I think, respond to uh, to certain crisis situations or si certain um, emerging uh, red flag situ type of situations. Um, we're, we're able to release um, information more regularly. I think that's that's one of the um, the tools um, that um, we we really need to to fully. Um, fully optimize um, to do our work effectively, to do communications work effectively. They say that um, if it's not on social media, it never happened. And to a certain extent, that's, that's true. There's, there's some truth in that. Um, so again, um, I think uh, the difference now is that we're, we're um, more alert. We have to be more alert. Um, I spend more hours uh, at work or focused on some work-related matter now um, that I'm, you know, um, relatively um, senior in rank to when I started um, almost three decades ago in the service, and I think that's that's uh, that's probably likely the way it's going to be until I retire. Um, and um, aside from uh, the frequency and the modality in which we we um, we um, we deal with um, communications um, with stakeholders, um, we also have to um, develop content for them. Uh, content for the stakeholders, which um, will present our position, but at the same time, um, send a message and, um, you know, do it in a certain tone that we empathize, that we understand the situation, that, that we're doing something um, about it. Um, uh, Asik Menya shared with you, you know, one definition of diplomacy, and, and just to just to add to that, I think it was um, Charles uh, Maurice de um, Telegrand uh, Perigord, who was a um, former uh, foreign minister of, of France, uh, who said that um, a diplomat who says yes means maybe, a diplomat who says maybe means no, um, and a diplomat who says no is no diplomat. So that, that's something that we normally have to take into, um, you know, take, in, uh, take into consideration when we do our communications plan and when we execute them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Shall I write 50 cents? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, look, um, civil society is about dealing with stakeholders who don't like each other, who hate each other's ideas and want to kill each other at every moment, right? So communication is extremely important. And one of the things that um, civil society organizations need to excel at is building trust, right? Building trust between between these different stakeholders who normally would not even consider speaking to each other. And I think that's been one of the key learnings that we've had um, in, at Ideas and some of my other organizations as well. Once you build trust, once you're able to um, build people, bring people to the, uh, to the same table, that's already a huge achievement. And that's where uh, change, um, positive change can occur because many, you know, Good communication can cut through a lot of the ignorance, a lot of the uh, presumptions, a lot of the assumptions and prejudices that people have. So I think um, the way to deal with that is to create these bilateral relations first with the stakeholders, build the trust, show that you have something to offer, show that you can help them achieve their goals and do the same with others and then bring them uh, together. I'll just, I'll just end there because I know we're probably behind time. Thank you so much for your answer. 
Um, those were really great insights from all the speakers. So I'll pass the floor back to Marius to ask the next question. All right, for the last part of our first part of this program, um, my first question, uh, my la the last question would be, I believe um, Mr. Pasage has already actually given insight on this already. So I'd like to ask our esteemed guest on what do you think are the pros and cons of virtual diplomacy, especially in today's contemporary society. Again, what are the pros and cons of virtual diplomacy and contemporary society? Anyone may start. <laughs> um, may I begin? Yes, you may. <laughs> yes, thank you. All right, uh, for the experience of the Office of ASEAN Affairs, well, I have to explain uh, that the lifeblood of ASEAN is really its meetings. You know, we have to meet to be able to engage in any kind of dialogue, any kind of progress, uh, any kind of, you know, um, activities and programs and trying to try to push forward the, the ASEAN community vision, as it were. Uh, and the only way to do that would be to do our regular meetings. It's built in into our into the ASEAN Charter. Now, what do you do when COVID nineteen happened? Uh, we had to, you know, we had to use the virtual format. It there was no choice. I, I think it, it has happened. Um, you know, suddenly Zoom has boomed. You know, um, suddenly everyone's using it. So I think everyone can empathize when when I say that uh, now. With, with the COVID-19, then definitely uh, the use of uh, a digital format has, has become, has definitely accelerated the way in which we do things, the way in which we have embraced um, digital technology. And this has been very good for us. You know, I, I think I'm not going to belabor the, for, the, the you know, the, the many, I think, advantages of, of, of doing uh, things virtually, it's cheaper. You know, you can reach more people. Uh, we've had this experience where we try to do a lot of ASEAN awareness. And, you know, when you organize an activity face-to-face, uh, -face, you can only invite at the most 200 people, I guess. So that's really going to be expensive. But suddenly now, we started to do our some of our seminars online, and suddenly we, we would hit like 10,000 views. You know, that's, that for us is unimaginable and crazy, you know, but at the same time, very exciting because it tells you that, you know, your reach can be really extensive. And that's really, that's really very, very, um, I think that's, that's, that's very, very beneficial when it comes to trying to put across any messages that you want um, received by the public. Um, it's cheaper, you know, um, and this, my, this is my personal observation. It has, in fact, made things, you could say, democratic. If you go to a meeting, for example, you have your head of delegation, you have chosen people to attend these meetings. The people who prepare the meetings um, don't, in fact, participate. You know, they, they slog through your talking points. They do a lot of the research. They send it up. And then everyone gets it and goes through it, decides which works, which does not, you know, and, and in the end, but you're not part of that main delegation that, that go to the meeting. And this is democratized. Uh, using a digital flat platform has, has made everything more democratic. And in fact, has become a really great learning tool. I think suddenly the knowledge is spread out. You don't have to hear from the participants of a meeting uh, with regard to what it is that has happened and to hear it secondhand. Suddenly you can hear it immediately and then it feeds into the work that you do. So it makes things so much more interesting. And I think your work deepens as a result of that. Uh, for, for ASEAN, our public diplomacy has definitely boomed. As I had mentioned earlier, we were able to reach a lot more people than we had originally thought or anticipated. The really big downside with all of this is we are in the business of diplomacy and relationships. You cannot establish a solid um, and really close relationship with someone virtually. You know, the only way to do that is if you meet them face to face. And this is definitely something that we miss. Um, also, a really big downside of this is that when you're engaged in, 
in really um in important negotiations over you know very heavy issues that 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 needs to be dealt with then you cannot do this you cannot do this virtually um you can do it only in so far as you can work on i think um you know less sensitive issues but the more sensitive issues will require a certain kind of finesse a certain kind of relationship that should exist between negotiators so you can have you can both be in a better position to understand and appreciate the views of the other person uh, or the other the other party without letting go of your own position as well and i think this is very important because part of the work that we do as diplomats is to negotiate and to negotiate well and if you don't work uh and if you don't work with a great relationship with the people that that you negotiate with then there will be i think there will be a great lack in the process and it will result it will result in not really excellent but it will show in the results that's what i'm saying thank you thank you so much assistant secretary terol ignacio who would like to go next in our esteemed panel can i say that there are very few pros to uh, virtual diplomacy. Maybe one is the fact that you always have cats in your uh, you know, chats, like my cat just appeared. But um, I entirely agree with the Assistant Secretary. Look, um, the cons are very considerable and very uh, uh, difficult to overcome because uh, connecting to my last counselor, right? So much of trust um, is built with those physical interactions with those laughs, with those comments about, you know, things other than work. Those are how you, that's how you build trust between people. Um, but I think the point that she made about uh, the, the more democratic uh, sort of, the way the platforms are like Zoom are, are designed is such that maybe some of those um, power, differentials are not so obvious and maybe that's a good thing right i think you, it encourages more uh, equality and participation um and perhaps that is one benefit which can be re-imported uh into um diplomacy once uh, we are able to do that physically thanks thank you so much as highness to present ibadin um, yes, if, if I may just quickly add, um, yes, I do agree with, with our other panelists um, and what His, His Highness just said. There, there are very few pros, um, but one of them, I, I think, based on my experience also, um, for at least for when we talk about virtual diplomacy, I'm, I'm assuming we're talking about what we're doing now, basically using online platforms um, to engage and to meet. Um, and that um, I feel that um, a lot can be done and a lot has been accomplished. Um, through, through this particular modality, but I do feel that um, what is lost is um, a certain dimension, as, as uh, Asik uh, Joy mentioned, to, um, you know, the, the fuller interaction and, and you know, a, a deeper appreciation of the dynamics uh, between um, parties sitting at the table, um, between two sides or, or multiple sides um, discussing um, mutual concerns and issues. Um, a lot of that has been lost. And um, we've had to dig deep and try to, um, as His Highness mentioned, try to develop trust um, in, in other ways, other modalities, um, trying to put in uh, the more human context, the more personal engagement, um, which is lost um, if, if, you, if you exclusively use and if you exclusively operate within the realm of virtual diplomacy. So a lot of that is lost really, and it's very hard to get that back. Um, but um, I, I do also must concede that um, a lot can be accomplished, but whether or not it's, it's more perfunctory, meaning I, we're done with uh, today's meeting, let's go on to the next technical working group meeting and on and on and on, and just look at our calendar and say, finally, at the end of the day, I've completed my, my work plan for all the online, all the virtual meetings I have to accomplish. So um, things get done. Um, papers do move, um, agreements are reached, but um, there may be there may be a price to pay later on. There, there may be ramifications um, later on down the road when we um, gradually resume um, in-person diplomacy. 
Um, and, and we are already um, doing hybrid um, hybrid versions of that now. So um, let, let's just see, we, we make the best out of the situation. Um, one other con I, I think is that uh, we're now slaves to our uh, mobile devices and our, um, and our computers and, and everything and in our headsets. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's, not that, uh, it's not that easy. There's also, a, there's also a physical and mental and emotional strain attached to that. But, but as I said, we adjust and we make the best out of the situation. Thank you so much, Ambassador De Vega. Assistant Secretary Menez, would you like to answer? Yes, uh, well, just to add, uh, I agree with everything that has been said previously. Um, but on the pro side, um, well, environmentally, uh, all the, uh, uh, the uh, carbon depleting <laughs> uh, 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 you know, by, by the travel that has been saved, you know, by all these uh, ASEAN meetings or UN meetings, etc., is one of the positives that you know a lot of the environmentalists appreciate. Um, and and as as the others have said, there's there are certain levels of uh, interaction. So certainly in terms of uh, breadth and scope and and immediacy, uh, uh, virtual diplomacy, e diplomacy, cyber diplomacy, however you want to term it, uh, has made uh, certain. Uh, functions easier. Um, but again, as, as was also mentioned, there are certain uh, tasks that diplomats do that require uh, the personal touch, the, uh, the development of trust. So in that uh, respect, uh, that might be a, a problem. Uh, another uh, drawback or con would be the dangers that the technology also brings because um, you know the the, the uh, phenomenon of fake news uh, and uh, uh, the bots were also mentioned uh, also uh, make it easier for uh, uh, misinformation and disinformation to uh, reach people. And therefore, uh, those of us in the uh, foreign relations field, international relations, need to be aware and to be able to react to instances where uh, this type of uh, fake news can affect bilateral or multilateral or even uh, you know, uh, the situation of your nationals in a country. Thank you so much to all of you for answering that, especially, of course, Assistant Secretary Menez. Now, that concludes the first three questions and our topic before we proceed to our open forum. Such wonderful insights from our panelists. I have a lot of takeaways for sure. All of our delegates have a lot as well. Um, what really stuck through me was that anyone can be a, a diplomat, but you know, it takes hard work. It takes to enrich our soft skills, especially on the way we communicate, especially if we do want to be um, diplomats, which will do so much. So much. Um, you know, there are so many pros and cons of virtual diplomacy today, but yeah, it's really all relationships really do play a part of it and long, especially when it comes to long term, um, you know, knowing that this is a long term thing. Um, yeah. Um, on what His Highness has, Tung uh, Zain Abidin has stated, civil society does play a very significant role. It may not be a diplomat, but it does keep, play a key role to the process, of course, of being participatory, which all of us can be part of. We can be part of civil society, and that is what makes um, public firms, um, nonprofit organizations very essential when it comes to policy, nation, or region building. With that said, um, how about you, Amalina? Well, I definitely learned a lot from this first topic. Uh, I'll be completely honest, I haven't considered the career path of being a diplomat, but maybe after this I will. Yeah. Um, I guess one of my other key takeaways is that even as students, there are approaches and concepts that we can adopt in our daily lives, such as strategic patience and the ability to, you know, 
have a high EQ and empathize with people, I feel like it will help our daily lives even when we're not diplomats yet. That's great, Amalina. That I'm sure our participants here can't wait for the panelists to address their questions. So at this point, we're now welcoming delegates to raise any questions they may have to our guest. So feel free to use the chat box here if you're watching via Zoom and use the comment section down below to our delegates that are watching from Facebook Live. We already have so many questions. And to begin, anyone can answer. Here's the first question. How can young people connect with their country's diplomats? Again, how can young people connect with their country's diplomats? As a well, yeah. if, if, if okay. I may. Oh. China's go. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, well, I, I, what I've noticed among the new generation of diplomats here is uh, they are also on social media, right? I, there are a number of very active, uh, at least Malaysian diplomats who are quite uh, receptive to communicating with people on, on Twitter. Um, and I, I notice a lot of the uh, foreign diplomats also have social media and they post about their events. Um, and even if they don't, um, even if they don't manage their social media themselves, uh, someone in the embassy is doing it, right? And I think that's one um, that's one obvious way to do it. A more institutionalized way um, could be through. Um, I know that in, in many countries, I'm sure in the Philippines, you have uh, things like the youth parliament, and of course, you you're doing your you have your model UN. There's all of these different um, uh, institutions, organizations already um, that will give you a uh, a way to to talk to. Not just your diplomats, but also to um, to um, uh, politicians and, and, and ministers as well. Um, as a student overseas, I found that um, the the diplomat the the, the, the ambassadors actually um, host things for students. I don't know if many of you are going to be students overseas, um, but I think that's one uh, another clear way in which you can interact with your with your diplomats. But I think things are changing. I think uh, the to go back to a point that was made in the keynote speech, um, di diplomacy is no longer a monopoly of uh, diplomats or foreign ministries. And I think the diplomats know this. Um, and I think that's why um, they All right, thank you so much, um, His Highness, to Cousin Abidin. I get you were choppy a little bit, but we got the point. Um, Ambassador De Vega, Assistant Secretary Menez, Assistant Secretary Terrell Ignacio, would you like to do? Yeah, yes, if, if I could just um, very quickly add that, um, yes, um, all the, um, the platforms that um, uh, His Highness mentioned that, that those, uh, those exist. Um, we do have uh, model UN systems. Uh, we do um, outreach with different um, uh, educational institutions in the Philippines, for example, and we do the same overseas. Um, it's a little easier now to reach a wider audience. In fact, uh, next week I'm having a virtual, something like this, a virtual, um, a virtual discussion with um, Filipino students in Korea, where where I just assume post. Um, and uh, it's true, quite a number of us are slowly um, becoming more active on social media. By the way, on a personal note, um, I'm on Instagram at MTDs on the Vega. Please follow if you want. <laughs> You're most welcome. Welcome to follow me. Um, and I'm also on Twitter at also at MTDs on, these on the Vega. So these are open accounts. So feel free to follow me. Help me reach 100 followers on Instagram. I'm, I'm almost there. <laughs> Just a little plug. But, uh, but yes, we do. And um, personally, I've, I've been um, very, very open to the use of, of social media platforms. In my previous uh, postings, I've done regular Facebook Live updates. 
um, where um, community members, other stakeholders um, can can uh, listen and view, and you know they they can type in their comments. And during the course of the uh, monthly Facebook Live, I'm able to answer, address as many as comments as I can. I haven't started that in my new post, but I will soon. Um, but um, I, I think it's it's a lot easier now uh, to get in touch um, with um, with with diplomats in different countries. Um, at, at least that's my experience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador De Vega, Assistant Secretary Menez, Assistant Secretary Terrell Ignacio. Would you like to add? Yes. Um... Well, I think it's worthwhile to mention that, in fact, there is an ASEAN uh, ministerial meeting on youth. Yeah, so we, we do have agencies across ASEAN that focus on youth matters, and most of them are run by the youth, in fact. I, I think that's the most important thing to consider. Um, so there is, there is an existence of a structure that incorporates the contributions and the participation of youth. And, and I would really highly encourage uh, our youth to be involved in this because this is primarily focused uh, for them and by them, in fact. So it, it's not simply a case of having a ministry that talks about you and works for you, but it's a ministry of which you are the youth and you are part of it and you are engaged in it. So you are in government. Um, second, um, when you are overseas, uh, we do tend to cultivate, in fact, um, relations with, with the student bodies. Um, mostly, and this has been my experience uh, when I have been assigned overseas, that inevitably, when you talk to the Filipino community, a major component of that community would always be student organizations. They, they form a really solid backbone uh, of the community. And, and in fact, uh, I've found that um, the approach has been very familial, I think. Uh, all the other, you know, organizations find, find the student organizations to be their little baby. So everyone's been very protective. Everyone's been very, you know, um, helpful and supportive of all the activities that they do. So if you find that any kind of conflict occurs at all within the community, you find that, in fact, it's a student, um, it's a student organization that tends to serve as neutral ground and they can help serve, facilitate, uh, and you know, enhance any kind of negotiation or any breakdown in relations that occurs within the community. So they do have very useful skills and I think contributions. Um, last but not the least, um, there is, I think, one of the deliverables of, of Brunei as chair for this year has to do with um, pushing for a um, youth peace and security agenda. So this is, I think, something that's very, very exciting. We, we have already begun talking about women's contribution in the peace and security agenda, but I think not a lot of focus has been put on the youth. And I think this is a really important contribution. So we're really looking forward to any developments uh, within ASEAN with regard to this particular uh, Bruneian initiative. Thank you. Thank you so much, Assistant Secretary Terrell Ignacio. If I may add, um, I was able, fortunately, I was able to attend one of these ASEAN meetings representing my organization. And there are really a lot of things ahead. There's the ASEAN Youth Plan for 2021 to 2025. Mm -hmm. There's the second ASEAN Youth Development Index that will be published. I'm not sure if this year or the next, but yeah, thank you so much for giving us that insight, Assistant Secretary Terrell Ignacio. Okay, um, Assistant Secretary Menez, would you like to? Um, Yes, uh, just to add a few more points, um, as was mentioned, you know, uh, social media has really uh, democratized and broadened the uh, field as far as interaction is concerned. And uh, DFA in the Philippines, of course, is present on Facebook, uh, Twitter, YouTube, and recently LinkedIn as well. Um, and uh, we do have, it's, it's part of my office's work to respond to queries uh, that uh, we receive on the social media platforms. Um, and, and you know, our Secretary of Foreign Affairs is one of the best examples. Uh, Secretary Luxin is the, uh, if you look at the Triplomacy uh, website, <coughs> which ranks 
uh, government, uh, uh, well, world leaders and institutions uh, based on their uh, social media interactions, Secretary uh, Loxin is the number one on Twitter worldwide uh, in terms of uh, the most active uh, government leader um, and by a rather large margin as well. I think of 75 uh, posts a day and number two is around uh, 40. So, um, uh, you know, a, a lot of the institutions, a lot of the diplomats are uh, available through social media, but the more traditional approaches of participating in uh, student uh, forums such as this uh, still uh, is another uh, way by which universities and organized student bodies can um, invite uh, the uh, diplomats and the foreign ministries uh, to learn more about the work they do uh, and how the youth might also be able to participate aside from all the institutional um, uh, activities uh, by uh, regional or international organizations. Thank you so much, Assistant Secretary Mendez, for that answer and to everyone for your insights. Now, let's proceed to our next question. And we have a specific question to Ambassador Terrell Ignacio. What tips would you give or what topics or books would you recommend to those who are aspiring to pass the Foreign Service Examination? <laughs> 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 well, thank you for the question. Um, there are a wide array of books, in fact. Um, let me see. For diplomacy, um, I think the most popular book right now, I, I found that almost everyone in the DFA likes reading The Naked Diplomat. So, And it's readily available. I, I think this is something that you should look at. This was written by a um, former ambassador. Um, to Lebanon, and it really talks about public diplomacy. And I think I find it fascinating, uh, mostly because um, it does tell you about the kind of impact that you can make as a diplomat uh, within, within the, you know, in the host country where you, where you reside, where you're assigned to. You can make a very positive impact. Um, he was greatly involved, I think, and immersed in the country. He understood the culture and the political dynamics. But most important, he approached the, the Lebanese public directly. And I found that really fascinating. He is very strong in public diplomacy. And in doing so, he became one of the most beloved, I think, ambassadors of his country. And, and it's a really well-written book. I, I would strongly advise you to read this particular, to read this particular um, contribution uh, to, well, I guess you could say diplomatic literature. I, I think though, I hate to volunteer, I'm sorry to volunteer, but I think that maybe our other speakers will be able to provide their own favorites as well. So, you know, maybe they may wish to speak and say which are the books or a book in particular that they would like to share. Yes, for sure. Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, some book recommendations from from a former um, from a former faculty member of uh, <laughs> uh, the literature department in, in UP. Um, the Naked Diplomat by Tom Fletcher is is a very interesting book. Um, just a, a note on on the author um, Tom Fletcher. He was the youngest senior diplomat um, in the British in the British Foreign Service, and um, I think that feeds and you, and you can see that when when you read the Naked Diplomat, um, a classic book on diplomacy, but take it with a grain of salt. I always say Diplomacy by Henry Kissinger by the Henry Kissinger. Um, there is a very interesting book for our Asian and ASEAN diplomats called The Future is Asian by uh, Parag um, Kana, if I'm not mistaken. Um, if you want um, something also a bit on the classical side of diplomacy, there's um, Sato's uh, Diplomatic Practice by um, Sir Ivor Roberts. And um, for, for aspiring Philippine um, diplomats, uh, those of you uh, from the Philippines who are part of the audience, there is um, a book um, written by one of our own senior diplomats, uh, former Undersecretary J. Eduardo Malay. He actually edited it. Um, it's called On the Frontlines of Diplomacy. 
So that's something very interesting. Another book I would love to recommend, um, but it's not available commercially. It is available at the um, Carlos P. Romulo Library of the um, Foreign Service Institute in the Department of Foreign Affairs, and this is um, Women in Diplomacy. Um, uh, this is a, a compilation of, of essays um, by women uh, diplomats from the Philippines, um, edited by, um, by another ASEAN um, advocate and champion, uh, former uh, DFA Secretary Ambassador Delia Domingo Albert, and um, some, some other good stuff, anything by Francis Fukuyama, Thomas Friedman, what else? Um, uh, and and also read you know don't, don't just confine yourselves to political science or or you know straight you know diplomacy works but also there's some interesting literary works um, which uh, deal with the world of diplomacy like the constant gardener by Jean Le Carré um, and um, you know so some other cities invisible cities by Italo Calvino they're they're wonderful beautiful English versions available thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador DeBengo. More reasons to follow you <laughs> for more book reviews um, and recommendations. Um, Assistant Secretary Menez, um, His Highness. Um, Thank you. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, go ahead, go ahead. Who is it? I don't have any um, more book recommendations, so perhaps I will skip this. Okay. Because oh. because Kissinger, Fukuyama, and Friedman, and others already mentioned are already very very good things to read, and I have no specific Filipino insights to offer, so I'll carry on. Yes. No. Uh, yes. Well, I think uh, you have to uh, look at this strategically. <laughs> I mean, obviously, if you're well read. Uh, on international issues and even on all other topics under the sun, you have an advantage because the foreign service exam, officer's exam, is about everything and anything. So it, it is very difficult to prepare as I think there are many blogs and other resources available that students probably um, consult about the FSO exam, uh, how to approach it. So um, it, it would really help, of course, uh, because uh, if you understand the exam, how it is structured, uh, what possible questions might be asked that year, uh, as I said, strategically thinking, then uh, it probably will lead you to um, what sort of reading material you should be looking at. Uh, but having said that, um, and if I have a few minutes, <laughs> um, the Foreign Service Officer Examination, and this applies to all the ASEAN countries, because I'm sure in, in all countries around the world, to enter the Foreign Service uh, or the Foreign Ministry, Department of Foreign Affairs, you need to take an examination. Uh, and it's, it is often one of the most competitive examinations that a government uh, will give. And basically, they uh, will really are structured similarly, but, but for the Philippines and on the screen that is beside me, you can see uh, for the Filipino uh, students in particular, you have to be eligible to take that particular exam wherever you might be. So are you a citizen, permanent resident? Uh, in the case of the Philippines, a graduate of any four-year bachelor degree course can take the FSO exam. In fact, in the DFA, we've had veterinarians, we've had uh, concert pianists, uh, priests, uh, who are colleagues uh, of ours. And I don't know if there's been any uh, um, study done, but I think if you look at all the uh, uh, educational uh, attainments of the people who eventually pass, I don't think there would be a, a, a very large percentage uh, in favor of international studies. Because as, as my colleagues just said, you really have to be quite well read in all aspects of of uh, of, uh, of uh, 
society because it is not only international politics or international economics, but there are also other aspects of the exams that you need to also understand. Um, and uh, so, as I said, there are sources that you can consult, uh, even uh, examples of past exam questions <laughs> are available uh, online. And, and uh, that is a good you know, resource just to give you an idea what the exam is like. And uh, uh, moving forward, uh, then you can prepare yourself uh, better uh, as you uh, will take the uh, Foreign Service Officers exam. Yeah. Um, if I may take the floor again. Yes. Hello. Yes, um, you know, um, it's, it's, it's really not so much that you look for a particular book because I don't think there is a book that contains all the information that you will need uh, to, to, to help you out with like the Foreign Service Officer Examination. Um, but I can tell you what I did when I passed. Um, my, my background is I... I actually finished um, interior design. That was my course uh, in, in my college days. And um, you can see it's really quite far off from, 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 from the FSO exam. Um, so I re realized uh, when I wanted to go in this direction that I really needed to apply myself. I really needed to learn a little bit more than what I usually do. A basic, I think a basic grounding would be I already had some kind of interest in reading stuff on current events, on what's happening in the world, on international relations in general, but, but it wasn't very deep. It was just a basic understanding and appreciation of what's happening in the world. So realizing this, the gap that I had, what I did was I created some kind of curriculum or structure uh, where I would take off certain topics, you know, that I felt would possibly be in the Foreign Service Officer Examination. And so every day, I would have like maybe five topics that I needed to read on. And I would take that when I would find something. So it, it was really a question of being very strategic with regards to how you want to approach, uh, how you want to deal with the exam. Because as mentioned it, it can be very broad ranging how, how you deal with how, how you reply to the examination. Um, the exam is structured in such a way that it does have an area on, I think, world international relations. One is in Philippine history. Um, and this is very important. Um, you're tested on your communication skills. So you have to be very good with your English and your Filipino. No? And the reason I think now through the years, having been in the department for a very long time, I realized that if you cannot communicate well and succinctly and precisely, uh, if you don't have, if you don't develop a vocabulary that's rich and colorful, you know, then, then, then I think you limit yourself tremendously and you're, you're unable to then you will be unable to produce the kind of work that is necessary in, in the foreign service. And that's the reason why these are on the test. And that's why it's very important that for you, you have to make sure that not only is your grammar good, but you have ideas inside you that you can express and you can express them well. So it's a combination of things. It's, it's like you have something uh, that you have to say so in other words, when you read something, and I really advise that you read a lot, you have to enjoy reading. I mean, you know, some people think it's a slog. Um, it's not just a question of having, being a very gregarious person and therefore having the capacity to relate with others well, but you have to be able to read a lot of stuff and in reading, maybe have some basic understanding or appreciation. I think the term that I used initially was deep literacy because I was so impressed with an article that I read about that. But it's really very important to do this. When you read something, you have to understand what it is that you're reading. And then you can, you're able to connect it with all the other stuff that you have read previously and other stuff that you're doing in your life because there are connections 
And the connection is, in fact, you. And you bring that into the work and you bring that into the foreign service examination because a lot of it is essay. So they will be asking you a lot of questions, which you need to be able to explain away. So I think what is appreciated is your capacity to think and to be able to express yourself well. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much, Ambassador De Vega, Assistant Secretary Menez, His Highness Tung Kusain Ipadin, Mr. Pasage, and Assistant Secretary Tirol Ignacio. That is our first topic, exploring the career paths in ASEAN diplomatic sector during COVID-19. We will not want to show our appreciation to everyone for your active uh, participation. We'll be now heading into a five-minute commercial break. See you then. Thank you. This video is presented by our major sponsor, Department of Foreign Affairs. Sustainability is important. We know that we need to be more sustainable socially, economically, and environmentally in order to create a thrivable future. But how do we know that we're doing a good job? What if we could measure sustainability? At Thrive, we measure what matters most. Meet Morris Fideli. He's the project lead for the nonprofit organization, The Thrive Project, and he's developed a software that can help measure sustainability. The Thrive Project is a platform, or indeed a tool, uh, for measuring the sustainability and performance of uh, organizations, the cities, and the whole of society. This tool can be used by anyone. I'm talking us consumers to big government agencies. Thrive is a practical tool. It's an online tool where you can actually, in quantitative terms, in, in what we call metrics, actually measure uh, performance. So this is, could be at a company uh, level, it could be at a city or indeed a country level. Uh, so measuring in actual uh, numbers uh, what's going on as opposed to just uh, relative uh, terms. 
no one person, community, city or country is sustainable in an unsustainable world. So what sort of sustainability can Thrive measure? Uh, everything, actually. We can look at things like uh, social issues like gender equality, uh, fair pay policy, uh, child labour, these sort of type of uh, issues. Uh, from the environmental side of it, things like pollution, uh, energy use, toxicity of, of, for example, the waterways, uh, and so forth, as well as the economic factors that we took into measure. The Thrive Project can help us change our actions to be more sustainable. And it's more important than ever right now to be sustainable. It's going to be sustainable because otherwise we'll become extinct in very simple terms. That's it. Uh, we already have a situation where more than 100 species of animals become extinct every day. It's not necessarily common knowledge because they're not, I mean, there's millions of species. But uh, we're on that uh, path at the moment uh, to become extinct if we don't actually change our ways. It's time for us all, individually and collectively, locally and globally, to own up to our impacts on planet Earth and make changes for the better. For the past 26 years, AHEAD has been providing students with quality educational services. AHEAD has excellent teachers from the best universities in the country. We offer various programs to cater to differing student needs. With our many brands, there's always something for every kind of learner. These have helped us become the most awarded name in the industry. But, these awards are not the goal. Our goal is to be excellent. To be ahead. All right, welcome back everyone. I hope you had a restful commercial break. I hope everyone is still alive and well. Now we'll be heading to our second topic for the Global Affairs panel. As seen in your screens, um, Amelina, are you there? Yes, thank you, Myris. So topic number two is all about fostering crisis resolution skills and social awareness among ASEAN diplomats policymakers, and public officials. Sounds super exciting to me. Indeed, it is super exciting. The topic would actually be delving into providing fundamental pillars to respond to these challenges through cooperation and trust. Without a doubt, this will set a foundation to current and future diplomats because this will help increase the level of adaptability and stimulate growth as diplomats, which they will be able to make use in their future endeavors, yes, to overcome challenges, especially as a nation. And with that, may we call our panelists to the virtual stage once again for our second topic discussion. We still have our esteemed guests from our first topic. We have Ambassador De Vega, Assistant Secretary Menez, His Highness Tung Cousin Abidin, Mr. Pasage, and Assistant Secretary Tirol Ignacio. Without further ado, let us begin our second topic. For our first question, what are effective means to address social injustices as a public leader? Let me repeat, what are effective means to address social injustices as a public leader? Anyone can take the floor who would like to begin. Um, can, can I just um, very quickly just uh, just, just some general thoughts on this. Um, yes, Ambassador. Just to make a distinction, as, as diplomats, um, we we do engage um, in in public advocacy, 
but uh, also within, within the context of our work uh, as diplomats, um, there are also certain Um, government policy making um, and advocacy. Uh, we, we do try and we do have programs in place uh, to advocate uh, for, for um, awareness, um, for awareness raising and education on social issues and social injustices. Um, just a few examples, um, our, our work on climate uh, diplomacy, for example, which is uh, be becoming uh, an increasingly uh, you know, loaded and heavy portfolio in our work as diplomats, uh, the Philippines being one of the most engaged countries um, in the whole climate, the, the international climate discussion, um, and also as being um, one of the most climate vulnerable um, countries in the world, and also within the regional and the sub-regional context within ASEAN, within the Asia Pacific region. Um, we do have um, programs and projects in place um, to reach various audiences, let's say on violence against uh, women and children, on, um, on uh, human trafficking, uh, we, we do a lot of advocacy work, we, we take part, we, we co-organize, um, we develop uh, seminars, uh, lectures, fora, um, and other means of raising awareness about these issues. So it, it's really uh, more in, in the realm of, of um, advocacy work in that sense. Um, we do present our country positions on, on social um, injustices and social issues um, in both uh, bilateral and multilateral um, you know, uh, fora and, and through these, through different modalities, um, uh, as uh, ASIC Joy from, from ASEAN can, can go more in depth into how it's done in ASEAN, how advocacy work is done within the ASEAN context. Um, but uh, part of our work as diplomats is also to be advocates. And um, increasingly, the advocacy work involves um, issues which, which have an impact on, on, on social injustices, on, on trying to correct um, social injustices, on trying to mitigate the effects of the many um, social ills um, that, uh, that affect uh, you know, Filipinos um, around the world and also uh, the international community at large. Um, we do a lot of work on education. We try to build programs with different partners for, um, for advocacy awareness, um, for, for example, um, on uh, gender and development, um, in, ensuring that um, particularly um, you know, emerging, emerging concerns are addressed um, in a very, you know, in, in, a, in a way that is based on, um, you know, an analysis, a deep and thorough analysis of, uh, of how these problems and social issues arrive and thrive and, and how we can respond to them effectively. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador De Vega, who would like to go next. Anyone can take the floor. Uh Maybe I can follow up on what Ambassador De Vega has said. Yes, Assistant Secretary. Okay, thank you. Um, she is correct. There are a variety of uh, initiatives that do exist to, you could say, address you know major social issues of the day that range from um, climate change to gender inequality uh, to dealing with uh, vulnerable populations like the elderly, uh, persons with disability. Um, a broad gamut of issues, including maybe the impact of, um, you know, terrorism, um, um, let me see, trafficking in person. So um, what I'm trying to say is in, in the ASEAN community, um, we have all at some level tried to address all of these major social injustices, as you would like to call them. Um, so. I will not delve too deeply into that. What I do want to talk about is more from my personal experience, which is my work within ASEAN as, um, as an alternate um, representative to the ICHAR. Um, ICHAR is it's the overarching um, 
human rights body within ASEAN, ano? And then um, on occasion, I sit there when 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 our representative to ICHAR, Philippine representative, uh, Ambassador Leda, is is unable to to make it for because of prior commitments. And it has been my experience that um, when when working on what you would term social injustices, it's always very important to be able to look at the root causes and to try to study and look at, I know this sounds very practical seemingly, but it's really very important to be able to delve into the root causes of what's happening. So when you talk about climate change, you don't just say, oh, we want this and we want that. Um, you have to separate it into different um, maybe facets of climate change. Are, are we talking about, um, let's say, the rising sea levels? Are we talking about um, the increasing um, and uh, the more the intensifying um, effects of climate, uh, of climate change on the typhoons that are happening in the region? So you have to be able to bring it down to a level which is manageable and then from there to be able to work a way in which you can find a solution. Um, ICHAR seems to appear to be, because it deals with human rights, it, it may appear to be for many people controversial, but it actually should not be because it, it deals with every basic aspect of our lives. And my experience in this particular body has been, we had tried to address uh, social injustices that occur on a daily basis based upon, um, how do you call that, very practical um, um, initiatives and programs that try to create an understanding and try to socialize what these norms, uh, what these human rights are. Um, in ASEAN, not everybody shares the same level of understanding with regard to how to implement uh, certain human rights standards. We may assume that what we believe in, particularly when it comes to social injustice, we assume that it is universal. It's not always the case. Uh, people have different definitions of what, uh, what is considered, considered to be social injustice. Uh, and you have to be able to approach a certain topic or a certain issue based upon how they view a certain issue. So if you can understand how they deal with a particular issue, let's say climate change, for example, the responsibility with regard to environment and how it affects people, um, then, then you will be able to find a better approach to things. Um, I mentioned before trying to socialize norms, and this is very, very important. You have to be able to share certain values. You have to be able to share basic understandings on certain things, on what is important and what is not and what is less important, what is a little bit more important. And in doing that, then you will be able to achieve some level of progress. I think it's the, sa the same is true when it comes to issues of women, for example. Um, we've always prided ourselves on the fact that in terms of, I think, gender equality, we have always been very strong in this area, at least for the Philippines. Um, so we've always taken... I think a leadership role within ASEAN when it comes to when it comes to addressing this particular area of you could say um, social injustice. So what do we do? We we try to socialize these norms into the different pillars. You no, know, we have the political, the economic, and the social cultural. So gender equality uh, in the work that we do isn't just found in the work of the social cultural pillar. It's not just something that our government agencies that deal with culture and um, um, social issues do. It has to be integrated into the work of, um, of, for example, agencies that are in the political realm uh, or the security realm, like for example, the Department of National Defense. So it has to be incorporated there. So this is the kind of work that we do. So um, in the nitty gritty, what we try to find is a way in which we can address more specific issues. And in doing so, we feel that this will, this will, this will prove to be a very effective way in which you can 
address the particular social injustice. So, um, I think the work of ASEAN is broad ranging, and it's you know, and it it can be addressed, and it can be done at many different levels. And ASEAN, as I mentioned, is a community, but it's comprised of a community of different pillars, which in its own, uh, in its own terms, is comprised of different sectors that all contribute to a specific end. So the hope is that we will be able to address what you would term to be social injustices through the many activities and through the many structures that ASEAN possesses. And this is what we do in particular when it comes to ICHAR, which, which deals primarily with, with um, human rights. Thank you so much, Assistant Secretary Terrell Ignacio. Who would like to go next? Um, well, uh, from the Department of Foreign Affairs, maybe uh, just to overlay what um, Ambassador De Vega and um, um, well, soon to be Ambassador Terrell Ignacio uh, has uh, mentioned, um, the issue of social injustice, issues of social injustice um, are dealt with, as was explained earlier, uh, through the work we do and also regionally, but uh, having been Assistant Secretary for UN and other international organizations before, the global um, discussions on social injustice, uh, I guess, uh, reflects the multilateral aspect of diplomacy. Because uh, for those of you who have uh, enrolled in international relations, international interdisciplinary studies, you know that there are bilateral relations and multilateral relations and the multilateral aspect of our work uh, has to do with uh, trying to find global solutions to global problems. And uh, many of these discussions, of course, uh, the, the largest organization is the United Nations. And within the United Nations, you have very many different um, discussion groups or fora uh, where particular uh, issues of social uh, social issues are discussed. So you, uh, as was mentioned, uh, issues of gender uh, were discussed and a convention, several conventions on, on social issues have been passed. Uh, you have uh, uh, the Human Rights Declaration. Uh, all of these uh, processes try to come up with a global standard uh, uh, that will hopefully be applied to all the member states uh, who agree to be bound by a certain convention. Uh, as you know, there are also reservations and exclusions to reservation uh, to these conventions. So, but the, the general uh, effort is to try and come up with a uh, a global approach, uh, common understanding, as was mentioned earlier, to what constitutes uh, or how to address a certain uh, social issue or environmental issue. And, and, and as was mentioned also earlier, uh, this, the, the range of actors has increased. And uh, social uh, civil society has increasingly played an important role uh, on the global stage uh, because indeed the voices of civil society are important uh, to uh, gain a broader and more fair understanding uh, of the problem and in that way to come up with a global uh, solution as well uh, there has to be a, a very broad uh, uh, consultation process, as well as a very, very uh, protracted negotiation process to come up with a final uh, convention to approach, uh, let's say, um, disability uh, or other you know, social ills. Thank you so much. <laughs> Assistant Secretary Menez. I just very quickly. 
So coming from the perspective of an employee from the labor department, uh, I'm given a responsibility by, an, uh, by our organization uh, to promote and uphold labor rights, and as well as to uh, a safe and secure uh, environment uh, for our people. Uh, in order to uh, address social injustices, uh, it's a simple task yet very important is to protect the basic rights of our uh, Filipino workers. Uh, strengthen social protection uh, for our for our uh, vulnerable workers by providing uh, livelihood and emergency uh, employment assistance, and also um, the department uh, intensified uh, the inspection of private uh, establishments to ensure that they are compliant with labor standards and labor law. Uh, that uh, in order to protect uh, the their Filipino. Uh, employees as well as their foreign national employees and um, so uh, in, in general uh, the DOLE continues to promote uh, gainful uh, employment opportunities, develop uh, human resources, protect workers and, prom and promote their welfare and maintain uh, industrial peace. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much Mr. Pasaga. His Highness Thanks. Um, one of the interesting things that was said is uh, I can't remember one of the previous speakers mentioned the fact that what constitutes social justice or social injustice is different in different societies in different countries. Um, and I think young people um, have a tremendous opportunity to, so, as we also, also mentioned, to socialize norms. Uh, in a way that was previously not possible. If you go on TikTok, right? Now, if you go to or Instagram or Facebook, you will see how there is sometimes such a shock initially when you see what is normal in one society being played out every day and very explicitly, which could be quite alien uh, to what's happening in your society. Now, obviously, um, you have to be respectful, right? Sometimes you can say, okay, that's interesting, but that's not for me. Um, and our culture, our society is more conservative or has other values and we can't uh, adopt that. But I think what that does uh, do is open up eyes. It helps to make people more um, tolerant. It makes people more understanding. So coming to the question about how you address social injustice effectively. I think if you want to be effective, you need to start from a position of, um, of, of humility. You cannot say that um, what I consider to be socially unjust is therefore unjust for everyone in the world at all times. Um, I think the process of socialization, the process of normalization uh, is a gradual one. Um, and I think if you, if you look at it logically, um, even if you go back one or two generations in a given country, you will find that the ideas of what is um, right and wrong also changes over time. Um, so we want to be effective, you start from a position of humility and you share, share experiences, I think um, that's what it is, you share experiences um, but I also know that others would disagree. Others would say that you have to be uh, combative. You know, you have to be very strong and forthright and speak up. I think there is a role for that. Uh, but I think the danger of that sometimes, and of course, you know, people will point to, you know, women's suffrage, you know, women getting the vote, you know, there was that element of action. And then of course, if you look, in, you look at Black Lives Matter, you know, the idea of protesting in the streets, is, is um, central to that as well. But to me, I think society needs, uh, no, needs that kind of activism, but also needs um, advocacy, which is uh, uh, there to look at how you change things on a policy level, how you seek to change things on a cultural and social level. Um, and I think you need, you need both elements if you're going to address social injustice uh, and change societal attitudes over the long term. Yeah. Thank you so much, His Highness. I agree, you know, it's to 
change the cycle, to break the stigma, to be an advocate is to change what is to what should be. And yeah, I guess that is how we start our topic number two with that amazing answers of the five of you as we start our second topic. Now let's proceed to our second question. Thank you, Myris. So our second question is um, going to be, I guess, answered from the speaker's individual perspectives, which is how can your job advance political stability as well as protect democracy and human rights um, to make sure that they're administered properly, especially when it comes to crisis-ridden areas like Myanmar? So this is a bit of a heavy topic, but I think it's important that we discuss important issues like this. So yeah, just to repeat, how can your job advance political stability and the protection of democracy and the administration of human rights in crisis-ridden areas such as Myanmar? Any of the speakers are welcome to go first. I mean, I'll answer quickly. Okay. So my job gives me a voice, um, both in reaching the lives of every Filipino and policy making between the labor and employers. Uh, in Dole, we always make sure that the rights and welfare of both the workers and employers are upheld uh, through the creation and implementation of sound labor and employment policies. Uh, with regard to the crisis-ridden areas like Myanmar, uh, in Dole, uh, we, uh, the refugees that come to our country, uh, recognized by the Department of Justice, uh, seeking employment in the Philippines, they are given equal em employment opportunities and a fresh start. Uh, they are, in fact, in, uh, exempted from securing a work permit from the Department of Labor and Employment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Asag. Um, our next speaker. Well, I'd like to address the issue of Myanmar, I think specifically. Um, coming off from our previous question and discussion on that, I must say that with regard to Myanmar, this is where you could say that there are limits to what you call socialization, no? Um, it's a very interesting time for ASEAN. Um, a lot of people have been saying that the situation in Myanmar and the way in which it's being handled is truly a test of ASEAN centrality. And you could say in a sense that it is true because uh, ASEAN centrality is really based upon the concept that we are responsible for what's going on in our own region and we are the driver's seat where we are on the driver's seat and therefore we have to be able to manage our own affairs so it's interesting that with regard to myanmar um we were put in a position i think where asean needed to grow and to be able to to grow we needed to address this particular situation and i think a franker manner um i i don't think I don't think it's a secret uh, that um, ASEAN member states in general have been very vocal uh, about um, their deep concern over the violence that has been occurring in Myanmar. And, and I'm, I'm happy to state that, in fact, the, our Secretary of Foreign Affairs has been very has, has very strong opinions on this. He really feels very strongly that we should really stop the violence that's happening uh, over there. He really feels that it's unacceptable, that it's an issue of decency um, with regard to how we treat, how the people in Myanmar are being treated, because from the perspective of ASEAN, they're, they're family after all. And this is not how you treat family. Uh, and um, he has been very strong about... Um, Bringing, bring the situation back to the way it was before to release, you know, the political detainees uh, led by um, Dam, Dame uh, Ong Sang Suu Kyi. And, um, and of course, 
he 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 is very particular about the need for humanitarian assistance so it's so it's like it's actually the way in which a lot of the asean member states including the philippines have addressed the situation has been to look at it both from a political perspective and to seek a political solution and then the other side is to try to assist the people of Myanmar directly because it is a very tragic situation right now in addition to the violence that's occurring i think everyone is also aware that um that um the covid uh pandemic uh has has been you know has greatly affected the populations in Myanmar you know the vaccinations uh the treatments um there has been great difficulty uh by the population to obtain this precisely because of the current existing situation um so for i think so here you can see in this a very interesting development within asean which is that it really for the longest time we have been very strong advocates of what you would term non interference in the affairs in the internal affairs of 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 our of our neighbors uh and at least from the perspective of the philippines we don't view it so much as interference as much as our concern for members of the community and that is how we approach that is how we approach um Myanmar no um so in a sense we are very firm we are very candid in expressing our views but at the same time we are respectful and in a sense the perspective is familial rather than adversarial um in that regard we don't really know whether how we are approaching things will be effective okay but our hope is that we can advance at least in some measure by being this candid uh in trying to protect democracy and human rights in in Myanmar uh i think you're also aware that we that the our leaders came out with the five point consensus so and we're very happy that a cent, the center of this is to come out with to have a to have a special envoy who has now been appointed that's Dato Erwan and um he fulfills two important roles within the uh within the within the consensus which is to try to talk to all the stakeholders so i want to point out here the importance again of talking to stakeholders and to engage in a dialogue as well so two very important things that that are being done and which are perceived to be really important in being able to promote some kind of political stability uh within the region specifically in in Myanmar thank you assistant secretary tirol ignacio um any other speakers would like to give their input otherwise we can move to the next question um sorry just just very quickly um uh, for for that particular question how how our job can advance political stability in crisis um in 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 crisis ridden areas uh, like myanmar on 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 a general level um you know the the philippines always uh, the philippine government always makes it a point um to align ourselves uh with uh with international with multilateral efforts um when needed and also bilaterally um but we do that very very conscious of um the, our core values uh which uh we we present uh, to the international arena core values such as the rule and adherence to the rule of law and adherence to internationally accepted norms um, in the international arena, um, adherence to um, a path of dialogue 
and peaceful settlement of disputes as opposed to you know, the exacerbation of disputes in other parts of the world. We, we, um, we've always had very, uh, very firm and strong uh, positions on that. And we do that bilaterally. We do it um, in various multilateral fora. We do that um, in regional fora like the ASEAN. Um, and, and, and this holds true for, for many crises um, ridden parts of the world uh, because we, we have, um, you know, specific interests um, aside from our general um, role, our general commitment uh, as a member of the international community. We have um, many nationals overseas, at least over 10 million Filipinos in all over the world, um, and many of them in, in crisis-ridden parts of the world. So we all, always have to take that into account. And um, specifically on Myanmar, um, personally, I, I share the views of, of Joy. Um, when she mentioned that um, we've uh, ASEAN has matured in, in dealing with, with things of this nature. ASEAN has always been seen as a model multilateral, as, as a model for multilateralism on a regional level. Um, we've been able to, so to speak, preserve the peace, you know, live in relative um, peace and stability. Um, which has enabled the region to grow economically, uh, to become more deeply integrated. And um, uh, as it, uh, Joy mentioned, you know, the, the analogy with the family, um, I'm, I'm taken back to um, a very, um, very wide ranging interview um, given by um, the late Ambassador Rodolfo Severino who was Secretary General of ASEAN and the former um, Undersecretary um, of the Department of Foreign Affairs of the Philippines. And he came in as Secretary General of ASEAN just for, for some historical perspective during a very critical period in ASEAN's growth. Uh, this was uh, just after at the tail end of the, um, the financial, the Asian, uh, the Asian, first Asian and then became a global financial um, crisis. Um, from around 2006, 2007, 2008. But for ASEAN also, it was um, a time when ASEAN was embracing um, really a deeper integration. Uh, but with deeper integration comes many challenges. It also meant a very, an even more diverse and complex uh, relationship within ASEAN. But um, I think at, at that point in ASEAN's history, it also emerged as a true community or a family we're in, like many families, there are differences, even very serious differences, but there was, there's always this underlying consciousness that um, the problem of one is the problem of all. Uh, problems, issues in Myanmar affect issues in the Philippines, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, in other countries, and that there has to be a very delicate balancing act or an equilibrium between um, national sovereignty and regional purpose, but also a very strong commitment to the ASEAN way of dealing with this uh, within the region, within the ASEAN family. And I think, um, you know, while the situation is not ideal in Myanmar, um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 you know, pleased to see as a diplomat that, um, that there is, there is a roadmap uh, that, uh, you know, there, there's, there's a consensus points which ASEAN is working on and which um, we hope will be received and implemented positively. Thank you. If I may, can I jump in? And I, I do have to say I have to leave in a, in a, in a minute. Uh, so I just want to, before I head off, I just want to congratulate all of you for doing this. I had a great time speaking with the other panelists. On the question of Myanmar, it's always interesting to hear ASEAN diplomats talk about it because it's obviously a very tricky situation. Uh, you have to, you know, you guys have to abide by the ASEAN way. I don't. Um, and, um, there are many, many uh, issues which, which make this uh, a very uh, delicate topic. How can my job advance political stability and the protection of democracy and human rights? Well, it, leading by example is always one good way to show that if you have a country in which you develop institutions, um, that if you yourself uh, protect democracy, have functioning parliaments and legislative assemblies, you actually um, acknowledge and protect human rights, um, then that is something which naturally will attract the admiration of other citizens in other countries. And that becomes a way in which citizens then 
through their own attempts at developing civil society, through their own interactions with their governments, um, and through elections, where they have elections, um, that, that agenda moves forward. There is another area which I think needs to be mentioned, which is the fact is what's happening in Myanmar is not confined to Myanmar. I don't know how it is in the Philippines, but certainly in Malaysia, what you see as a result is a huge influx of people, um, you know, Rohingya refugees and, and, other, uh, and others. And um, one way in which civil society has been very active in Malaysia is to show, is to fight for them, right? To show that, look, they are victims of persecution uh, and they deserve to be uh, protected. They deserve asylum, if not necessarily, I mean, it's a very, again, a very sensitive issue. What, you know, how, what rights do you want to extend to uh, refugees? In Malaysia, we don't even, the, the, the 1959 Convention on Refugees is not even signed. So you don't even recognize them legally. So there's all these issues, but I think what civil society can do is to show that um, people who are persecuted um, can be welcome in neighboring countries, can contribute um, to society, and ultimately can become role models so that they can one day contribute back in their home countries um, on their own terms. Um, so I'm very, very sorry. I do have to um, leave, but I'm, I hope that uh, you've enjoyed the Malaysian civil society perspective. I know I haven't had much chance to talk about some of my other roles, but hopefully in the future, um, there will be that opportunity. So thank you and congratulations again to the team. His Highness, can you stay for a bit? But thank you so much for sharing that wonderful insight. We've had a very deep um, discussion, especially when we gave out the lens of dealing with a crisis such as Myanmar. You also do know, everyone, it's also to our speakers and delegates that it is 9 p.m. So we've gone over time, but I'm sure that we've learned a lot. Unfortunately, we won't proceed to our third topic and we will proceed to the awarding of certificates. But I'll tell you this personally on a moderator, um, besides on being a moderator, I'd like to extend my gratitude to our speakers, our panelists, our delegates for staying. I know we want, I know some of you would want us to extend, but for the convenience of everyone, we're sticking to our um, prescribed time. Thank you so much. With that said, let us present our certificates. Hello, good evening, everyone. Let us now begin the recognition for our dearest panelists. Let's start with Certificate of Appreciation is hereby awarded to His Highness Tuankung Zain Al Abidin Idni Tuankumur. In grateful acknowledgement of your competence and expertise rendered as Speaker of Global Affairs Panel Forum for the 4C ASEAN Youth Leader Summit 2021, awarded on the 10th of September 2021 at the Lasalle University in Manila. Signed by Mr. Alan Sorla, Yola Asmun Com Advisor, Ms. Erica Arcega, Yola Asmun Com President, Ms. Romjun Muller, Project Director, and Mr. Lance Chua, Project Director. His Highness, kindly look at the camera and smile beside your certificate. Joanne? Okay, please smile in three, two, one. Thank you. Thank you so much. Project, yes. Project Directors, please. Mr. Lance. Okay. Okay, please smile. Three, two, one. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we also have uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Eduardo uh, Menez. So the Certificate of Appreciation is hereby awarded to ASEC uh, Eduardo Menez in grateful acknowledgement of their competence and expertise rendered as a speaker of Global Affairs Panel Forum for the 4C ASEAN Youth Care Summit 2021. Awarded on the 10th of September 2021 at De La Salle University, Manila. Signed by Mr. Alan Surla, the LS Mooncom Advisor, Ms. Erica Arcega, the LS Mooncom President, Ms. Romjan Miller, Project Director, and Mr. Lance Shua, Project Director. 
All right, um, Assistant Secretary Menez, please smile for a quick picture taking. Matt, smile in three, two, one. Thank you. Now may we have the project directors, please. Here. Okay, please smile. Okay, where is the, where is Mr. Lance? Okay, here. Please smile in three, two, one. Thank you. Certificate of Appreciation is hereby awarded to Her Excellency Maria Teresa Bison de Vega. In grateful acknowledgement of the competence and expertise rendered as a speaker of the Global Affairs Panel Party for the 4C ASEAN Youth Care Summit 2021, awarded on the 10th of September 2021 at the La Salle University, Manila, signed by Mr. Alan Serra. DLS Mooncom Advisor, Ms. Erica Orsego, DLS Mooncom President, Ms. Ramden Miller, and Mr. Lance Jua, Project Directors. Okay, good evening, um, Her, Ex Her Excellency um, De Vega. Please smile in three, two, one. Okay, smile again, three, two, one. Thank you. We also have the Certificate of Appreciation is hereby awarded to Deputy Assistant Secretary Marian Jocelyn R. Tirol Ignacio in grateful acknowledgement of their competence and expertise regarded as a speaker of Global Affairs Panel Forum for the 4C ASEAN Youth Career Summit 2021, awarded on the 10th of September 2021 at the De La Salle University, Manila. Signed by Mr. Adam Serla, DLS Mooncom Advisor, Ms. Erica Arcega, DLS Mooncom President, Ms. Ramjan Miller, Project Director, and Mr. Lance Chua, Project Director. Okay, good evening, um, Deputy Assistant Tirol Ignacio. Please smile po in three, two, one. Thank you. Now may we have the directors, Project Directors. Okay, please smile in three, two, one. Another one. Thank you. Certificate of Appreciation is hereby awarded to Mr. Wilmer Carlo B. Pasage in grateful acknowledgement of your competence and expertise rendered as a speaker of the Global Affairs Panel Forum for the 4C ASEAN Career Summit 2021, awarded on 10 of September 2021 at the Salle University, Manila, signed by Mr. Alan Serla, DLS Mooncom Advisor, Ms. Erica Orsega, DLS Mooncom President, Ms. Ramjan Miller, and Mr. Lance Chua, Project Directors. Okay, good evening, Mr. Wilmer. Um, please smile in three, two, one. Thank you. Now may we have the project directors? Okay, Mr. Lance. Okay, here. So please smile in three, two, one. Another one. Thank you. Okay, I guess we can proceed with our group photo. So, uh, Jasmine, can you stop uh, the share screen first? And uh, delegates, you can now turn on your cameras and uh, so that our esteemed speakers could see all of you in our corporate attire and uh, meet everyone. So, Joanne, you can now Okay. Okay, we have a total of three slides, so bear with me and keep smiling, please. So for the first slide, please smile in three, two, one. Thank you. For the second slide, please smile in three, two, one. Thank you. And for the last slide, please smile in three, two, one. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the tech team and thank you to the to our project directors. Um, to our speakers and our panelists, kindly stay in the Zoom call as we will be transferring you all to a breakout room to thank you all for your invaluable contributions to the success of our event today. But before that, may we ask our for may we ask our uh, speakers um, any final parting words before we finish this um, 
uh, event today. Any any words? Any final words for our delegates today? Um, are we still on? Or? Yeah, yeah. Um, any any final words? Um, no, just um, thank you very much to everyone. A privilege again and an honor to be with um, the other co-panelists and most especially with um, with the audience. Um, just um, just uh, very happy that uh, you're, you're doing this and that uh, you're aware at such a young age. And I guess the key to being good global citizens um, is also to uh, being good local citizens and. That means, um, in your case, um, doing well in your studies, really taking advantage of all the um, of all the things that you're exposed to um, in your um, respective educational paths, and uh, hopefully, and to balance this also with social awareness and also um, your personal um, interests outside of school and. Um, and uh, outside of your regular tasks and bringing all these things together, I think will make uh, everyone uh, better, more empathetic um, and uh, more open and inclusive and, um, uh, and tolerant uh, and, and, uh, and fair human beings. And that's, that's all what we hope to be anyway. Um, so keep safe, uh, keep healthy. Marami salamat po. Thank you for those inspiring words. Um, any, um, any other speakers today who has final words for us before we leave? Perhaps uh, uh, Secretary uh, ASEC um, Ignacio, would like to, would you like to say any final words to our delegates? Yes. Um, you know, um, I would highly encourage you to take up a career in diplomacy. If you feel encouraged, uh, you know, inspired by what has been uh, discussed in today, today's forum. Um, diplomacy can be a complicated, difficult, uh, you know, but very fulfilling, I think, profession. In a sense, it's a, it's a kind of advocacy. Uh, you have to have your heart in it to be able to enjoy it, to be able to find, uh, you know, uh, a great fulfillment in it. But, but I think, I think, um, if, if this is something that you are really keen uh, to get into, then inevitably you will naturally develop all the necessary skills that you will need to be able to bring you to the goal which you so desire to attain. Um, I can only say that personally and professionally, being a diplomat, has been, you know, one of the best experiences of my life. I, I think, I think, had I chosen a different profession, I would have ended up with a completely different, I think, personality and perspective of the world. And although it may appear difficult uh, to try to um, create very clear lines of um, I think um, action when it comes to addressing social injustices in the world, there is in fact a place for diplomats and even for you, whether you become a diplomat or not, to be able to engage the world in a very productive and I think positive manner. So I really enjoyed myself tremendously at this forum. I think I learned a lot as well. I love hearing uh, be engaged in a dialogue in this conversation uh, with our other esteemed speakers. And I thank you for your questions and your interest as well. And I wish everyone well. So have a good evening. Thank you for those kind remarks, um, Secretary Ignacio. Um, could we move on to Secretary Menyes, please, um, for our final parting words? Yes. Uh... Well, thank you. Uh, I'd like to congratulate the organizers again for um, having this ASEAN Youth Career Summit. And I know that um, you also had uh, panels on the private sector opportunities. And of course, we tonight represent the public sector. 
And uh, while I would join my fellow colleagues from the DFA in encouraging uh, those of you who want to pursue a career in diplomacy to take the um, uh, exams uh, to join the department. Uh, actually, you can also join the department in other capacities, and so that's also a possibility. Um, but uh, having two children of my own who have, you know, uh, are already uh, of a certain age, uh, older than most of you in the audience, um, I know that uh, international relations is a much broader field, and you don't necessarily have to, uh, you know, pigeonhole yourself uh, into uh, diplomacy. There's international organizations, there's international civil society, uh, so many other uh, areas where each and every one of you can find a place under the sun. Um, so I will encourage everyone to continue pursuing whatever interest you have and to try and contribute to uh, making the world a better place to live in. And it doesn't necessarily have to be through diplomacy, but certainly through any other, uh, uh, well, uh, profession or advocacy that uh, you feel passionate about. And I think uh, if you feel passion for something that you do, then the chances of uh, your success and of your being able to make a positive contribution to society uh, increases uh, much more. So again, thank you to everyone. Thank you, um, Secretary Menyes. Um, uh, could we move on to uh, Your Highness Tanku? Maybe any final words as well from, from you? Well, I have, think I said what I wanted to say already, uh, but I would echo everything that has just been said. Um, the world is vast, it is changing, and there are many things which are becoming more and more urgent. I think we haven't really spoken much about um, the climate, right? The environment. I think this is something which all of you have a much keener awareness of. I think all of you have a much keener awareness of different aspects of social justice which we touched on earlier and it's it will be up to your generation to carve out how to address these things and ASEAN is a very important platform because as time moves on the geopolitics of this region means that of course you must love your country but there must also be the regional angle which will serve as a very important um, platform as other geopolitical trends uh, come to come to our doorstep, so I leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Your Highness Sanku, and thank you for staying with us for extra some extra time. Um, lastly, we have uh, Mr. Pasaku, if I pronounce that correctly. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers and, of course, the delegates of this event. So my advice is probably from a young professional per perspective is to maximize the remaining days of your college life. Because uh, when you come to the corporate world, when you start working, it's a different monster, it's a different arena. And uh, don't, don't be afraid to take risks. Uh, if don't pressure yourself if ever uh, you uh, you want a specific field, don't be afraid to explore because when you find uh, your the true happiness uh, in your work, in your company, in your job, that's uh, that's a better that's a better that's a best sign of success. And of, of course, I encourage you to upskill, reskill, and retool. Uh, in order to cope up with the changing world, to the changing industry, to the digital age, the digital era of things. And of course, if ever you have um, concerns regarding to employment or career guidance, you can message me and uh, follow me. And I'm, a I'm just a chat, a chat away and I can refer you to the focal persons that can help you with your concerns. Thank you very much and have a great time. Thank you.
So, I guess, so we would like to thank everyone once again, and especially to our esteemed speakers, to everyone coming from the Global Affairs panel. So we hope that we gave you a lot of things to know, and hopefully it gave you a lot of tips for your future careers. So with that, let us end with the opening prayer led by Mr. Bernard Lee. Let us remember that we are in the presence of our divine maker. Dear God, it has been a long and tiring day, but in you, we find strength. Thank you for allowing us to be with one another despite the challenges our world faces today. You showed us that we can do so much more when we are together. Please grant us the strength to be the change that we all wish to see and to be global citizens for the common good. Keep us all safe that we may see one another in person again soon. Amen. Our Lasallian prayer, I will continue, O oh my God, to do all my actions for the love of you. St. John Baptist, let us all pray for us. Live Jesus in our hearts forever. Thank you, Bernard. And thank you so much again, everyone, for joining us in the first ASEAN Youth Korea Summit. And this has been your host, Simon. And um, please be reminded to sign the exit form. You may find the links on the screen in front of you. Once you complete this, you will be able to secure your delegate certificates. Thank you, everyone. Good night and stay safe. You may now proceed to exit the forum today. Thank you very much, everyone. And apologies again for running over time. We hope you enjoyed today's event. Thank you. For C ASEAN Youth Career Summit 2021 features Workforce Singapore. For C ASEAN Youth Career Summit 2021, we'd like to thank the following sponsors. Our co-presenter, Deloitte. Make an impact that matters. Super Cheeto. And Dev Curie. Our major sponsors. Launch Garage Innovation Hub. Startup Acceleration by Founders for Founders. Philippine Digital Asset Exchange Incorporated. Karma Farm Incorporated, keeping it natural. CodeGo. Ahead Learning Systems Incorporated. Thrive Project, measuring what matters most. Global Manila Group, be borderless. And Dream Action, integrated AI powered human capital solutions for predictive self assessments and recruitment solutions. Our diamond sponsor, WorkBank. Let's invest in you. Our platinum sponsors, Coronia. And Morning Clothing. Our emerald sponsor, Gardenia. Zalora Philippines. And Salties, your printing partner since 2011. This event is also powered by Keen Studios and brought to you by Wicked Candles. We would also like to thank our media sponsors, Business World's Sparta, U.ph, Tech Kuya, and Astique.ph. For CSC and Youth Career Summit 2021 would also not be possible with our partners. Our Ruby partner, European Studies Association. Our gold partners, CPU College of Arts and Science Provincial Council, Qualified IPH, Filipinos Career Accelerator, San Beda Junior Marketing Association. Bida Juan PH, UNSW ASEAN Society, Transcend, Inglicom, Lasallian Youth Orchestra, Management of Financial Institutions Association, Student Catholic Action, DLSU Online SDG Youth Action Forum, DLSU Kura Humanitarian Legal Assistance Foundation And DLSU Office of Career and Counseling Services 
our silver partners. Biko University Order of the Blue Feather Society. Model United Nations UPD Leman. Biko University United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization Club. Kilos Co Youth. Adenea Project for Asian and International Relations. And Philippine Institute of Civil Engineers de La Salle University. Desmarina Student Chapter. Our bronze partners, DLSUIS History Club, UST Industrial Engineering Circle, Animo Model United Nation, De La Salle University, Das Marinas College of Engineering, Architecture, and Technology Student Government, and FAST 2020. UPLB College of Arts and Science Student Council, UP Business Management Society, De La Salle University Das Marinas College of Liberal Arts and Communication Student Government, University of Asia and Pacific Local, UPLB College of Arts and Science Freshman Council, Pagdika Project, the Ateneo Assembly, Charisma Movement, Polytechnic University of the Philippines, International Studies Executive Consortium. Kabataang Voluntario and Physics Society Adamson University. Global Millennial Group hadir untuk membantu kalian. Membantu kalian yang merasa bahwa sekolah, kuliah, pendidikan formal nggak pernah cukup bagi kalian. Kami menyediakan platform-platform di mana kalian bisa bertemu dengan orang-orang yang sama, konferensi, submit, competition, kelas-kelas soft skill, dan lain sebagainya. We are a one-stop soft development solution. Contohnya Global Millennial MUN. Di sana kalian bisa belajar negosiasi, diplomasi, bertemu dari orang dari seluruh penjuru dunia. Wonder Voices, kalau kalian ingin fokus untuk memperkuat public speaking kalian. Indonesian SDG Submit, ketika kalian diminta untuk melihat dunia lebih dalam, bahwa kita sedang tidak baik-baik saja, dan memberikan solusi kalian. Atau... Di global Indonesia, ketika kalian ingin menggebrak batas diri kalian dan menjadi pemuda yang go internasional. I'm Urshia Kalicha and I have been a student of Wonder Voice Speech School. Hi, this is my Arora. Hello everyone, my name is Jocelyn and I participated in the GMMUN. I'm Mika Villanueva, a country ambassador of Global Millennial Group for the Philippines. Hi everyone, my name is Nidifar, I'm 19 years old and I'm from Tajikistan. 
I'm not going to lie to you, my experience at Wonder Voice has been one of the best experiences of my life. I found some really great connections here. I got the chance to lead a global team and conduct events internationally. And from that previous conference I joined, I gained so many friends. They were all funny and nice and it also helps my public speaking skills. It is a journey combined with challenges and experiences that will make you put a check off your bucket list. During my internship, I gained a lot of valuable skills and experience. It was my greatest pleasure to work with high motivated Indonesian youth with diverse background and mindset. Masih banyak lagi yang bisa kalian butuh. Solusinya sudah ada. Sekarang pertanyaannya adalah diri kalian. Kalian tidak perlu untuk menunggu menjadi orang paling pintar, paling cerdas, paling hebat. Tidak. Zig Ziglar, seorang penulis Amerika pernah berkata, You don't have to be great to start, but you have to start to be great. Kalianlah yang harus mulai and make yourself work the rules. This is the story of Dea. In a few months, she'll graduate and make a big decision, choosing a major. But which one? Should she be a graphic designer? An accountant? You know what? She decides to find out for sure what she really loves doing. Right, here we go. So, from her personality and interest, her dream job is to be a developer. Ah, that's right. That's where her passion really is. Now it's clear what she should study computer science. So, she sends her uni application confident in her choice. This is Dea. In a few months, she'll graduate and make another big decision. Her first job ever. But where? All right, let's find out which company is right for her. Hmm, okay, let's see. So, from her personality and working style, hmm, it's a match. This company is a perfect fit for her adventurous personality. Her psych profile is also fit for a developer, so she knows it's the right one for her. This is the story of Dea and her dream job, doing what she loves. Discover the right career for you with Dream Talent. Go to dreamtalent.id and discover your dream career.
whether you're off to work, on the road, or out under the sun. Always have the confidence to be what you want. Play. Work out. Have fun. Because there's always a Coronia color to match every Filipino woman. So keep it fresh. Keep it vibrant. Keep it colorful. Celebrating 50 colorful years with Coronia. Sustainability is important. We know that we need to be more sustainable socially, economically, and environmentally in order to create a thrivable future. But how do we know that we're doing a good job? What if we could measure sustainability? At Thrive, we measure what matters most. Meet Morris Fideli. He's the project lead for the nonprofit organization, The Thrive Project and he's developed a software that can help measure sustainability. The Thrive Project is a platform, or indeed a tool, uh, for measuring the sustainability and performance of uh, organizations, the cities, and the whole of society. This tool can be used by anyone. I'm talking us consumers to big government agencies. Thrive is a practical tool, it's an online tool where you can actually in quantitative terms, in, in what we call metrics, actually measure uh, performance. So this is, could be at a company uh, level, it could be at a city or indeed a country level. Uh, so measuring in actual uh, numbers, uh, what's going on as opposed to just uh, relative terms. No one person, community, city or country is sustainable in an unsustainable way. So what sort of sustainability can Thrive measure? Uh, everything, actually. We can look at things like uh, social issues, like gender equality, uh, fair pay policy, uh, child labour, these sort of type of uh, issues. Uh, from the environmental side of it, things like pollution, uh, energy use, toxicity of, of, for example, the waterways, uh, and so forth, as well as the economic factors that we typically the Thrive Project can help us change our actions to be more sustainable. And it's more important than ever right now to be sustainable. We want to be sustainable because otherwise we'll become extinct. Very simple terms. That's it. Uh, we already have a situation where more than 100 species of animals become extinct every day. It's not necessarily common knowledge because they're not, I mean, there's millions of species but uh, we're on that uh, path at the moment uh, to become extinct if we don't actually change our ways. 
It's time for us all, mutually and collectively, locally and globally, to own up to our impacts on planet Earth and make changes for the better. De La Salle University, through the De La Salle Model United Nations Community, presents POSI, a CN Youth Career Summit 2021 organized by De La Salle University's first International Central Committee, in partnership with Southeast Asia Global Affairs Network, co-hosted by CN Youth Advocates Network.